Uh, welcome to the course. I'm going to be recording these lectures so that anyone who might have missed the class on a particular day will be able to catch up to it on YouTube. Uh, if you look up in the upper right hand corner, you can toggle between speaker view and gallery view. Sometimes I go into gallery view so I can kind of see all your faces at once and interact with you. That can be kind of fun. That's when it's, you see it like Hollywood squares. Uh, when we're doing notes, I try to switch over to speaker view, uh, but speaker view will kind of show you whoever the last person that talked was. So you can lock your speaker view on me by finding my little box, Brendan Britton, and double clicking on it. That should lock this full screen so that you can see the notes that I'm going to give you. So give that a shot. Okay, um, one last thing, just a small point of etiquette. Uh, because the microphones are sensitive and they can pick up a little bit of background chatter, uh, why don't we all, except for me, try to mute for the moment? Uh, oh, sorry, I just muted myself. <laughs> uh, that does not mean that I want you to stay mute, okay? Participation, you guys shouting things at me and interrupting me, will make this class more fun for you. It'll keep it interesting. But in general, uh, by keeping the microphones on mute until you're ready to contribute, that'll just cut down on some of the ambient background noise. You might have to put up a little in my room, but that's about it. So that's just a good strategy to unmute when you're gonna talk and then when you're done talking to mute so everyone else can hear clearly. Let's start off with a slide before we get going here. Um, start off with this slide. Okay, so here's the thing. I wanna to talk to you guys because uh, with the exception of Tim, you're all new peoples to me. And I want to hear from you guys to hear if you know the difference between astronomy and astrology. Do you guys know what those two things are? Adrian says she, uh, he does. So Adrian, can you give me a, a, a hand there and help me? It doesn't have to be fancy, just simple words, okay? <clears throat> um, astronomy is more, has more to do with the study of the actual planets itself. And astrology has a lot to do with stars and constellations and how people believe it has bearing on personality. Yeah, okay. So. There are some things that I think that, that you got right there. There's a couple of things I would take a small issue with, but let's put them up on the board and let's, let's hash it out. You had the right flavor of the feeling, shall we say, okay? So on one side of the board, let me go into speaker view here. Okay, so come on, bear with me. There we go. Uh, it really bothers me when my board looks weird and wacky and crooked, but sometimes the geometry of the thing doesn't make sense. It, I don't think it's my chalkboard, but it could be. Okay, whatever. It'll do. So we have astronomy on one side, and we have astrology on the other side. They're not the same thing, and we got to talk about it before we talk about anything else. So uh, Adrian says, study of planets. Fine. I can get behind that, okay? And for astrology, she's, uh, he said, study of stars, constellations. However, Adrian, I will assure you, sorry, this weekend I had friends over who wanted to look at all my books, so I took my whole thing down and now it's in chaos. All right, um, Adrian and friends, I would like to assure you that Astronomers also study stars, 
and constellations, as well as other things as well. They study things like galaxies. They study supermassive black holes and quasars. They study gas that's floating around in space. Hell, astronomers even study the whole damn universe, which is pretty comprehensive since by definition, the universe is everything that ever has and shall and will be, right? Now, one thing that I think, so I, I'm just making the point. Hello, Destiny, welcome to the class. You should share your camera with us if you can handle it, okay? Because that way I can get to know who you are. Um, Adrian, I did like it when you said this has to do, what was your exact word? You said astrology studies how it relates to our personalities. Is that what you said? Yeah, how um, do you believe it has a bearing on personality? Yeah, how stars affect personality. So which one are we here to study then? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Astronomy. Yeah, okay, all right, cool. Um, <clears throat> there's a little more to this. Uh, what, are, what are some things that, uh, you know, I just wanna make sure that we have a nice robust discussion about the difference between these two things because people get them confused and I don't want that happening. Um, do you guys know anything else about astrology, about how they study your personality? What, how does this work? Are they interested in all the constellations or just some of them? Just some of them. Which ones? Zodiac signs? Yeah, very good, uh, Janabelle, the zodiac signs. Janabelle, do you know how many zodiac signs there are? 12. There used to be 12 back in the day. Now there's 13. I'll tell you about that in a second. 13 constellations of the so-called Zodiac. The Zodiac could be like a $10 vocabulary word that we learned today. Um, that comes up from time to time in the study of astronomy. I'll define it in a little bit. Does anyone know how many constellations there are in total on the entire night sky? Like. If you take this thing, this is a celestial sphere. It's a model of all the possible constellations that one could see in the sky from various localities on Earth. And because the stars remain relatively fixed compared to our perspective, we can count a finite number of constellations if we look out in all these different directions. Now, there's no reason you should know such a thing, but I was just curious. Maybe Tim, maybe Tim, who's taken my 1020, where are you, Tim? Let's find you and pick, oh, he's already hiding. He had a good idea to hide from me. Okay, so <laughs> any, I don't suppose anyone knows how many constellations there are in total. There are 88 constellations on the celestial sphere. So what I'm trying to ask you guys, what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is, if there are 88 total constellations, then why are the astrologers only interested in 13 of them? Why do 13 constellations affect your destiny, but why not any of the others? Why doesn't anyone tell me that they're a Vulpecula or a Camillo Pardalis? Why can you only be a Sagittarius or a Capricorn or a Taurus? Why can't you be an Ursa Minor? Culture, maybe? I know like different countries celebrate different types of zodiac signs, like Chinese cultures and stuff. 
Yeah, that, so that's an interesting point. Um, our, 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 the, official, the official constellations, the 88 constellations, which are recognized by the International Astronomical Union, are Western based uh, in that they go back, many of them to Greek and Roman, hello there, Greek and Roman studies of uh, astronomy. However, the constellations in uh, the Chinese zodiac are actually quite similar to the ones that the Westerners use. For instance, uh, the, the tail of Ursa Major, the big bear, you guys know it as the, the Big Dipper. The, in the Chinese astrology, they, or in Chinese astronomy rather, they, they saw that as a plow. Um, at some point, when the International Astronomical Union got together, a, a corpus of astronomy professors from all over the world decided that they were going to choose these 88. And so there were people from all over the world that had a buy-in on that. But mostly they just went with whatever was simplest and easiest to keep track of. <clears throat> but, uh, but astrology, uh, at least you know the astrology that you read about in the newspapers and that people talk to you about at the bar, that tends to be a sort of a Western-based construct that goes back hundreds of years. Let me explain to you why they're only interested in 12 or 13 constellations. It has to do with where we see the sun throughout the course of the year. And to help here, I'm gonna need a slide. Uh, okay, it doesn't want me to do that. Bear with me here. I guess I can only have one slideshow at a time. This picture, slide 58. In this picture, this depiction, you can see the Earth going around the sun as you've been taught it does in the Copernican model of the solar system. And because Earth's orbit around the sun is very close to a perfect circle, this circular path that the Earth makes maintains a kind of fixed orientation in space. And because of this, we can see the sun projected against a backdrop of different constellations throughout the year. But we don't see them projected against any old constellation. We see them projected against 12 particular constellations. And you guys have heard of these before. They're your signs, right? Aquarius, Capricorn, Gemini, Libra, Virgo. These are the 12 constellations of the zodiac. However, uh, <clears throat> over long periods in time, the orbit of the Earth can change because of a, a quirky effect called the 26,000 year precession of Earth's axis tilt. Um, Earth doesn't simply maintain a fixed axis tilt in space, but over very long time scales, gravitational influences between Earth and the moon cause it to precess or to wobble like a top. And this precession shifts the perspective of the sun with respect to the background stars. So that today, the sun now drifts through a 13th zodiac sign known as Ophiuchus. But in any case, why don't we start by writing down the central premise of astrology so that we can understand how it's different from astronomy. The premise of astrology goes like this. The location of the sun against the background stars And here's the real kicker. On your B-day, all right, that's your birthday, will uh, determine your personality type and your destiny. And that's a real whopper. The location of the sun against the background stars on your B-Day will determine your personality type and your destiny.
Go ahead and jot that down. In other words, when I think of an astrologer, okay, I think of an astrologer that someone looks like this, okay? This is what an astrologer typically looks like. And the message of astrology usually sounds a little bit like this. Everything's going to be great. You will be rich, okay? So that's the message that astrology has for you. Now, <clears throat> on the other hand, this is what a picture of your everyday astronomer looks like. This is a very famous astronomer, Edwin Hubble. He discovered that the universe is expanding. The message of astronomers goes like this. We're all going to die when the sun enters its red giant face. So you'll notice that the message of astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message of astrology. And yet, people are getting these things confused. Well, if you'd like to alleviate your confusion, you might read about them in different kinds of periodicals, right? You could read about your uh, horoscope in a magazine that looks like this, and you could find that magazine in the supermarket checkout line, okay? And uh, in this astrology magazine, you'll learn all sorts of important things like how to balance your mind and your body and your spirit. And Uranus moves into Pisces. Expect the unexpected. <laughs> who, would, who would expect the expected? Um, and all kinds of things like, you know, love is waiting for you in aisle five and things like that. If you want to read about astronomy, the first thing you'll notice is that you're going to have to pay a little bit more, right? This magazine here costs about $2.50. A subscription to a peer-reviewed journal like Science or Nature, whew, those might cost you a few hundred bucks a year, um, and hopefully you'd get your employers to pay for that because it's very expensive. Um, also, the threshold for publication is different. It's one thing to write an article for this magazine, and it's another thing to write an article for this magazine. And in both, you might want to come up with your cockamamie theory about the universe. I'd imagine if you want to publish in Dell Horoscope, then you have to walk into the editor's office with an energy crystal on your forehead and you have to say something like, bro, I am deeply in touch with the stars. And the cigar chomping editor will look at you and say, I love it, 50 cents a word, I'll see you deadline on Monday, all right? And that's it, you're ready to publish. Here, if you want to do, uh, publish something in science, first of all, you have to go out and do something first. You have to go to a telescope, you have to collect some photons and stay up all night feeling really sleepy. You gotta, um, write some code and analyze the data. And then before you can publish, you have to submit your article to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you. These are people who are not exactly your friends. And after they've gone through it with a fine tooth comb looking for any possible issues, and they've decided there's nothing technically wrong with the research, then they will, then they'll allow you to publish in, in this magazine. So it's, it's much harder to get an article written in this thing. Now, why do people get them confused? Because as we saw when we were talking with Adrian, they both have to do with stars and constellations. Um, astrology concerns itself with your horoscope. This is a chart that they cast by trying to examine where the sun was on your birthday in relationship to these 13 constellations. The problem with the central premise of astrology is that astrology makes a statement about physical objects, which we are all capable of observing and sort of testing the validity of their statement. Um, that's because the statement mostly has to do with, or entirely has to do with, objects in the physical world. For instance, the sun is a physical body. Not only can we observe it on our sky, but today the Parker Solar Probe is taking a flyby mission where it's going to scoop down through the outer atmosphere of the sun and collect particles from the outer plasma of the corona. So the sun isn't something we just observe from a distance. We've actually kind of gone out and we've touched it. Um, the stars, unfortunately, we have not figured out how to touch yet, but we can collect light from them and we understand many things about their chemical compositions. Your birthday is kind of a historical fact. You go to the town hall, you look it up, and there's not too much you can argue about there. And then you get into things like your personality type or your destiny. I guess for the destiny part, you could wait for, till you die, and then you could ask yourself if you did anything fun. 
personalities, people try to measure them in a, in a subject like a, uh, psychology. They attempt to measure people's personalities. I don't know what the latest greatness is, but you know, maybe you have a Miggs Breyer personality test and you ask people a bunch of questions. Do you like puppies or do you like kitties? Do you like popsicles? Do you like ice cream cones? And then you can kind of classify someone as a alpha dog or a beta wolf or something like that. <clears throat> In any case, the point that I'm trying to make is you can go and you can try to measure a person's personality and you can compare their destinies to where the sun was on their birthday. And if you go out and you do this in a systematic way, every group of people who have ever undertaken to examine this statement have discovered the exact same thing, that the premise of astrology is a false statement. Just straight up, not true. Five Pinocchios. There's actually no relationship between your personality and where the sun was on your birthday. And you know, even the simplest observer would quickly realize that there are obviously way more than 12 or 13 personality types out there. People are strange and funky and they have ways of wiggling out of little boxes that you try to put them into. Oh, so, you know, one way you can jazz this up is you don't only consider the sun, but also where the planets. That helps you that helps you keep it a little more interesting. But it doesn't matter. Even if you include the planetary positions, you don't find any correlation between a person's personality type and the uh, and where the sun was on their birthday. Now, because of this, philosophers who study what is science and what is not science and what is religion and metaphysics. They have labeled astrology as something called a pseudoscience. A pseudoscience is something that sort of uses some technical jargon, some trappings to make it sound like a, an actual science, but actually their statements don't hold up under self-scrutiny. And even the, the things that they propose, if you investigate them closely, don't, don't actually work. So probably we want to stay away from that, right? We want to avoid confusion in our lives when we can help it. On the other hand, we could instead think about things like this. Do you guys know what this is? It's kind of an iconic picture from space. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. It's a beautiful seahorsey shaped cloud of hydrogen gas out in the belt of Orion. This is what the real universe is made out of. Weird cold clouds of hydrogen gas and giant spheres of radiating plasma. That's pretty weird, right? That's pretty abstract. Maybe that's something we should look into. We should find out what's going on up there and see if it has any connection to our everyday lives. Not, not in the astrology way, like waves are going to come down and bop you off the head and make you get pizza for dinner. I'm talking like, where did all the human beings come from and how do they relate to these clouds of gas? Things like that. Um, anyways, I don't know what you guys are planning on learning this semester, but let's start off by learning one really, really, really important thing. Astronomy does not equal astrology. They're not the same thing. And you don't want to write me an email saying, Dear Professor Britton, I am in your astrology 1010 class because I'm going to reach for my keyboard and say, delete, delete. And I'm going to pretend like I'd never met you before. Okay. So uh, with that in mind, uh, welcome to the course. You are here to study astronomy and in particular, a branch of astronomy that deals with the solar system. So we're going to be looking at all these guys. Do you know, do you guys know your planets already? Do you know the names? If I like picked a random planet, could you tell me what it was? Let's try it. Uh, what's this planet here? Neptune. Very good. Neptune is blue. Uranus is green. And you guys know these, right? What's this one? Venus. This is Venus, unfortunately. 
Oh. Um, this is showing you a radar image of the surface of Venus. So if that's Venus, what's, what's this guy? Mars. Mars. Good. Okay. Right on. So not everybody knows all the planets, but a couple of you do. But, you know, I'm just trying to, part of me figuring out how, how fast to crank this throttle depends a little bit on what you guys come into knowing. Most people come into it knowing nothing, but if you guys know some stuff, then, you know, I can entertain you better. Oh, and who am I? Professor Brendan Britton. Here's an action shot of me at the CCRI telescope. Thanks, marketing department, for making me look like a weenie. Okay, anyways, uh, uh, I've been teaching this class a long time. It would be really cool if at some point I could take you guys out uh, to look through this telescope because it's a really wonderful experience. But, you know, COVID-19 and all that, the observatory has been closed for a little bit. Uh, maybe at some point when the class is over and things relax a bit, you guys can come out and look at this telescope. It's one of the funnest parts of the course. Now, listen. I know some things about astronomy and I know some things about how we're gonna have a good effective class. My job is to make sure that you learn some things, that you're not terrifically bored at all times, and also to kind of keep cracking the whip and making sure that we're turning in our homeworks in our labs so that you guys can get good grades at the end. I get it, I understand, I think why you're here, you need to fulfill a lab credit science. You're maybe a little interested in astronomy, maybe not. Um, <clears throat> and I'm gonna help you achieve that goal that you have, which is to get through this class, have it be mildly fun, learn something, and get some good grades that you can take on to your next uh, courses or college. Now, if you want me to help you do that, you're going to have to kind of just basically do the little things I ask you to do. I need, I'm going to ask you to come to office hours so we can do our homework together, and I'm going to ask you to be there for the lab and sometimes participate, but I won't ask you to do that much. Um, so just trust me and uh, you'll have a great time. Now, who are you? Uh, besides Tim, who took my 1020 class, I don't know the rest of you guys yet and it's gonna take a little time to get to know you. Uh, I can't stress enough that even though it's sometimes annoying, sharing the video screen really helps. It helps foster a sense of class community and engagement. Obviously you don't wanna have your camera on all the time if you wanna eat some Cheerios or something, I don't care. But if, if, if I never get to see your face, I will not get to know you. I won't know who you are. It'll make it harder to help you or to just understand you. And if the class was everybody muting their video screens and just me talking into an empty box, the class would be less fun for you too. It will be a soulless class. I don't think you guys want that. So I know not everybody likes to contribute at the same level, but you know, take, be engaged or just try to, just try to be here, that's all I'm saying, okay? Just try to be here. It'll, it'll help the whole class go a lot smoother. Um, whoever you guys are, I'm gonna treat you with the dignity and the respect that you deserve because you paid $500 to listen to me talk about planets and seahorsey shaped clouds of hydrogen gas. And I thank you for your patronage. It's a wonderful arrangement we have here and hopefully we can have a good time. Whoever you are, you're gonna have to show up on Mondays and Wednesdays with the following two things. The first is a calculator. I'm gonna tell you exactly which model I want you to buy. And the second thing is a positive attitude because while the course can be fun at times, we're also gonna have work to do. And if you try to get into it and you try to have uh, a good time with it, um, we'll all have a much better experience of the class. You've all decided to be here. I don't exactly know why, but now that you're here, we should try to make it as, as fun as possible, right? That's how I think about it. For the most part, the class won't be too much hard work. We're gonna study the solar system, and the solar system is a very cool place to be. Um, we're gonna get to learn about Earth. Earth is where you live, and one of the big messages from our class is going to be that Earth is a surprisingly cool planet that has a lot of interesting and diverse geology. There's a reason why life exists here. So although I personally wanted to study astronomy so I could get as far away from the Earth as possible, and just find myself lost in abstraction in a nebula somewhere, one of the unintended effects was that you start to look back at your own planet with new eyes and realize how interesting it is. We'll study the moon because everybody loves the moon and that's an astronomical object that you can see with your naked eye, no telescope required, although a small telescope or binocular really enhances the features you can see. 
and you'll get to learn about what these different areas are and how old the moon is and why it's all beat up with craters. We'll study the sun. The sun's an important part of our solar system. Um, it also affects the planets and changes how they evolve. And then, of course, the eight planets, no longer featuring Pluto. Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? Who knows the answer to that? Uh, Adrian, give it a whack. It's too small. Well, here's the thing, though, Adrian. We always knew that Pluto was small. We were never confused. Well, it took some time to figure out its size, but there are tricks you can do to measure its size. And we always knew it was small, and we were still okay with it being a planet. And then one day we weren't. And smallness wasn't exactly the issue. Although it is smaller than the other planets. No? Tim, do you know? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> it Did it not form when the rest of our solar system formed? We kind of scooped it up? No, uh, it, it was not a ca captured object, although that is capable of happening and has happened in the history of the solar system before. We believe that Pluto is indigenous to the solar system. It's, it formed here. But it formed, well, I, I guess it's a different class of object. So it's not that it was captured here. It has more to do with the fact that Pluto is not the only object out there that is like Pluto. So the, the idea is that, you know, hold on, let me get my slideshow back. Uh, years ago, when Ma and Pa took the solar system course, or when Grampy and Grammy actually took the solar system course, then there was the sun and there were the nine planets. And after Pluto was just the inky void of space, nothing in between you and the next star. But the problem is that things that are out there are far from the sun. And since most objects shine light by reflected sunlight, it's very, very hard to see things out there because they're dim. And as our telescopes became more powerful, we began to discover other objects that were similar in size and composition to Pluto, but also had screwball orbits like Pluto does. And these are things like Quayawar and Sedna in 2003 EL61, now known as Hyumea. Each time we found one of these things, they were a little bit smaller than Pluto, but like Pluto, they were made up of a mixture of ice and rock. And we began to worry that there were perhaps many hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of these objects. And it was only a matter of time, of course, until we found one that was bigger than Pluto. At first, they called it 2003 UB313. Then the astronomer who discovered it tried to name it Xena because he was a fan of the TV show, Xena Warrior Princess, and thought that would be cool. And the International Astronomical Union said, no way are we gonna let you do that. Um, so they eventually kind of got together with the, with the body of professors and they decided to name it Eris. And Eris presented uh, a special problem for, for astronomers, which is as Eris was bigger than Pluto and Pluto was a planet, then they were, they were thinking, well, we got to make Eris a planet now too. But then Eris and Pluto were so similar to all these other guys that it seems logical that if Eris was a planet and Pluto was a planet, then these other guys would have to be planets too. And then that was a problem because they started doing calculations that showed there might be hundreds of thousands or even millions of these objects. And it started to look like Pluto wasn't as special as it used to seem. We got lucky in finding Pluto first, but Pluto is part of a class of objects that today are known as Kuiper Belt objects. The Kuiper Belt is one of the realms from which comets come from. For instance, Halley's Comet is also similar in composition, and Halley's Comet comes from the Kuiper Belt. So we, we decided to redefine what a planet is in such a way that it would keep the Kuiper Belt objects out. But because Pluto and Eris and a few others are so large and so interesting, we gave them a special intermediate status called dwarf planets or minor planets. And 
the point being that Pluto is not a planet anymore, but it's still there and it's still cool and it's still interesting to think about. It's just that we've learned more about the solar system as time has gone on. Okay, maybe we'll talk more about that. Let's talk about this. Uh, this class, oh, you know, I never really defined what, uh, what astronomy is. And astronomy could be thought of one of two different things. You know, it's a, it has aspects of a natural science. A natural science is where you observe nature, but you can't really touch it or manipulate it. Uh, but it also has aspects of a physical science like physics or chemistry. And in fact, much of the background one needs to study the stars and the planets is a background in some basic concepts in physics and astronomy. Um, and physical sciences have to do with not just studying planets and stars and galaxies, but sciences ultimately have to do with measurements. Measurements are what makes sciences different than other enterprises like, I don't know, uh, art history or, uh, or, or, or even philosophy, right? You get a tool like this here, meter stick, and you go out and you measure some things. You measure the size of a planet. You measure the distance to Pluto, something like that. Once you start taking measurements, you start building up some numbers. And then you get a hankering to do some math so you can understand what all of those numbers mean. And what I'm trying to say is math is an important part of any science or any physical science like astronomy. Without it, the course would not be the same because it would be impossible for you to understand the gargantuan nature of some of these objects. If you look out at the moon and you're fascinated by the two different types of terrains and you want to know about the impact craters and you think that's really cool, you're going to need to develop an appetite for some boring things like a diagram or an equation so that you can understand how the moon came to form. If you are amazed by, what's this planet here, class? What am I looking at? Jupiter. Anyone know? Come on, somebody's got to know what this Mars? is. Jupiter? Jupiter, that's right. This is the great gas giant Jupiter. This is the biggest, baddest planet in our solar system. Do you guys know what this is? Oh, man, I just must have grown up as a nerd because I knew all about this. Oh. Big red look, dot. The great red spot. The Great Red Spot is a massive hurricane system which has persisted on Jupiter for hundreds of years. This hurricane is like two Earths in diameter. You can't know that unless you study math, okay? That's the only way to know such a thing. And that's why you guys are going to need to get one of these. This is the official calculator for this course. It's called the Casio FX260 Solar Calculator. I want you to write it down. You are going to go out and you are going to buy this calculator. It costs like eight bucks at Walmart or wherever calculators are found. It's not expensive. I'll be bringing mine to class every single day. The reason why you all need to get the same calculator is because I'm going to train you to do things with this things that you never would have thought you were capable of doing before. But I can't train you on how to do the work in this course unless you have the same calculator that I do. Some of you may have another type of scientific calculator from another course. That's great and all, but I still don't think you should use it. I think you should shell out eight more bucks and buy this calculator. It's got a couple of nice features. First of all, it's solar powered. And not only is that, a, you know, stylistically appropriate for a class that will study the sun, but also it will never die on you during an exam. Secondly, it's got the buttons that you're gonna to wanna to use on a daily basis in a very convenient location. Thirdly, most of y'all don't know nothing about nothing, and I need to fix that, okay? Unless you know where your fourth root key is, when it comes time to take a fourth root, I wanna be able to say, everyone, 
place your buttons and your hands there and push these keys, okay? Now you don't have to know advanced calculus or even algebra really to take this course, although it helps. I'm gonna kind of teach you what you need to know to survive. But without this, then you can't, you can't even play the game, okay? So can we all make a pact? I, I don't suppose, any, Tim, do you have yours? Oh, wow. Hey, look at you, Megan. That's, oh, Jen, right, because I sent out an email. Oh, oh, you guys, I love you. You guys are already earning, earning points in my heart, okay? So some of you already went out and got this thing, huh? Hey, uh, Olivia, how much did it cost you? Well, you're muted, buddy. Um, my, I got it at Target. Um, I believe it was like um, $13 around there. Okay. All right. That's not bad. Um, yeah. Who else? Who else did I see have? Uh, Janabelle, did you have one too? And Megan? Yes. Um, we got mine. I got mine at Walmart, and I believe it was like nine dollars. Oh. Yeah. Target's a little more pricey. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Whatever. I mean, yeah. as far as school materials go, let me tell you a secret. I'm gonna try to make this course so in the box that you might not even need to get the book or the lab book, which are normally the expensive things. So if you could make it through here spending 13 bucks, you've done good is what I'm thinking, right? Now, some of you may want to purchase the textbook and I'll talk to you about the textbooks in just a second. But you, some of the people in my summer one class just got the calculator and just showed up for everything. And then that was cool. And that will save you guys oodles of cash. So you can shell out 13 bucks or nine bucks for me, okay? Um, Cause that's, that'll be cheaper than most courses. Uh, the calculator is so important to get. I, now you guys knew to get it because I sent out that email last night, right? So awesome, awesome sauce. I'm gonna start training you on this thing today. So if you don't have it, uh, is it Ayanna? Did I say that right? Okay. And Andrew and Vinak, get these ASAP, okay? Oh, you got it, awesome. All right, you're making me happy. This is um. Because I have the um, solar number two, is that fine? Because you said either one yep. or two is fine. Yep, I, I, because, because I'm an old dog, I got the Mark I, but the Mark II is exactly identical. It's just whiter and it's a little bit cuter mm -hmm. and smaller. So, but either okay. one is great, okay? Um, okay? So that one's great. You're, you're definitely gonna use the hell out of that thing. Take it out of the box. Okay, uh, okay. so now that we've had our intro speech about uh, astronomy and astrology, why don't we, uh, let's talk about the classroom system. So you guys are obviously going to be uh, interested in how your grade is determined. And we kind of just have to go over some boring stuff like how do I grade you and what are you expected to do for me? So let's kind of get into that. Showing up to lecture counts for 0% of your grade. And that's because you paid money to ask me to teach you about stuff in space. And I'm happy to do that. So I'll be here hopefully every Monday and Wednesday and I'll talk to whoever wants to listen to me talk about space. However, you are gonna wanna earn some points in this class. Uh, you will have to take a test one day and most of the things that I say during class will end up being on your test. So watch out for that. Um, I'll try to record these and I put the lectures up on YouTube. At some point I should give you guys a link to my page you know, one of the weird things about recording my lectures, which up to now I've never done before, is I've already recorded all these lectures for the solar system class that I taught in summer one. But I wasn't going to just schlep off the old ones on you guys, although that could be helpful if I ever get sick or something. Hopefully not. But um, if that happens, uh, I, I could potentially do that. But I'm going to try to show up and be a part of this class each day because... I want to give you guys that personal experience, you know, and, and I want you to be able to ask questions to me and for us to talk together. I think each class has its own psychology and you guys deserve to have your own. Uh, but however, this is a great resource because I know sometimes things happen in your lives and you may need to want to watch a lecture. So I'll try to post these up on my YouTube channel uh, each day, especially if you need to go back uh, I don't know exactly what my channel is. New channel on YouTube. I think it's this. I'm gonna make use of our chat feature here. There we go. 
So I think that's my channel, if you guys ever need to go to it and, and watch a lecture. I'm still figuring this thing out, you know, with recordings and stuff, so, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about how you do earn points in this class. The first place uh, that you can earn some points is by doing labs with me. And we're gonna have a lab today on measurement powers of 10 and scientific notation. And all of the labs that you do during the semester are worth 25% of your grade, pretty big chunk. The good news is that labs are really easy and there's just some hands-on activity for us to do. And I will guide you through the doing of the lab each class. So uh, let me just kind of spell out how our, our lecture works because it's a little bit different than what it might have uh, said there in your sign up uh, page. So our class is going to have a structure to it that will go like this. Um, we're going to have a lecture. And the lecture is actually going to go from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. In the, in the sign-up sheet, it says that the lecture is 12 p.m. to 2.30. And it says that the lab is 2.30 to 4.30. I think we need just a little more time for lecture and a little less time for lab. So our lab goes from 3 p.m. to 4.30. So it's still the total same length of time. Things that I will do for you to try to make your life better. Um, because three hours is a very long time to listen to someone talk, I understand that. We'll take a little tea break. And although the time may shift around, the tea break is, I don't know, maybe uh, usually 1.30 to 2 or so. And that's just time for you to chill out, stop having to pay attention. That's time for me to drink some tea or eat a sandwich. You guys will come to really appreciate tea break. It's, it's good psychology, okay? Um, sometimes I'll try to get us out a little earlier when I can. If I can speed the lab along, I might even be able to let you out at four o'clock. I'm sure there'll be no objections to that. Um, but <clears throat> there's also another dimension to this class as well, and that's the office hours. But you're gonna wanna hear me out on this. Office hours for my uh, class go from about 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Actually, it's kind of more like 10, 20, honestly, but somewhere around 10 o'clock, the, the office hours start. And I'm gonna tell you about how the office hours work. In addition to earning points by doing your lab, uh, by the way, there's a lab book for this course. The lab book is the, <coughs> Astronomy Man Wilson Astronomy Manual. It's actually no longer in print. So what I've been doing is just kind of making some photocopies of the key pages and sharing them with you. So you probably won't need to buy that, uh, which is good because it'll be difficult to buy. Uh, why don't we show you how that works? If you guys are over in Blackboard, uh, let me get to the appropriate page here. You can go to the lab section. Okay, and our first lab here is on lab one, powers of 10. I've actually uh, provided you with the PDF that you need. So when you click on this, these are the pages that we're gonna have to work on in our lab today. In fact, we'll probably only get through a couple of them because I bet we're gonna be behind as we usually are. So you guys can hit print on that if you'd like. I'm gonna hit print now so that I have it come lab time. So print those out. If you don't have a printer, you may have to recopy this by hand into a notebook. I'll show you how to do that later. By the way, let's just, let's just talk real talk. Uh, how, many of you, how many of you have access to a printer? Yeah? Okay. Maybe I should have asked how many of you don't have access to a printer. Is anyone here not? Megan, you don't. And Andrew don't. Okay. If you guys don't have printers, you've got one or two options come lab time. You can either try to get a, a program that will write on top of the PDF. One of my students uh, showed me a way to do this beforehand. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this feature, but one of my students showed me last. Hold on, let me share my screen with you again. And then there's a service online, it's called Dot Loop. Dot Loop? Yes. You can upload the, pro the file and then you can um, 
write on it? Right, exactly. Type over a sign, whatever you need to do. Jennifer, will you, will you cut and paste the link to that in the chat room for everyone? That would be sick. Um, that's cool. So that's. I, I don't know if it's a paid or if there's like a limited. I'm going to double check right now, but I'm still going to oh, post it. There, there's another one. Uh, there's another one as well. Hold on, Jennifer, you might want to see this too. Hold on a second. Okay. If you guys are over, one of the ways that students did it last time, if you guys are in Blackboard, I think it's Blackboard. Oh, I think it's like the CCRI homepage. There was like a little, a little thing of dots, like a little bar of dots up here. And you could, you could access all these. Oh, I know. I think you had to use Internet Explorer, which is a very ugly browser that I'm normally opposed to. But I think if you use Internet Explorer, was that, did you have to use Internet Explorer? And let me try going to CCRI and see if this works here. Uh, I may have to log in. Can I log in from two? There was, there was like a little box, shoot. I've got to go back and watch this lecture and figure out how he did it. There's a little box of dots here and you could access all these programs through a web browser. Like you could open up Microsoft Word or you could open up, um, pages or something like that and you would be able to write on them you know what i'll try to figure this out during tea break so i don't waste too much time but there is a way to use all of these programs through your ccri screen i just think that you i don't want to log into that because i don't want to log out of this one because i need this for our, our lecture today was it up here okay you know what i should have thought about that beforehand i'm going to look into this uh, I'll see if I can phone a friend. Um, in any case, can I tell you in the meantime what might actually be simpler uh, for Megan and for Andrew? You might just have to recopy these down by hand onto a piece of paper and just brute force it, okay? I just need something that you can upload to show me that you were there and you did the work and you have the answers. All right. So anyways, I'm getting a little distracted. Oh, pardon? Can you like type on it or does it have to be handwritten? You can type on it. Yeah. Whatever you can do. But if you can type on it and then submit it, that, that's fine. Um, I do have an issue about maths though. Um, if you're, this is an important message to the entire class. Uh, let me call up an equation editor. Uh, like, let me call up Microsoft Word for a second. Uh, if you guys are typing up math in this course, I do not want to see this kind of stuff. Like that's really horrible for me to grade and I can't, I can't follow your math if it's just like pigeon line math. What you have to do is you have to be a big boy or a big girl and you have to use your equation editor. So you go to insert, you go to equation. And if we're, I'm going to teach you what stuff we're going to be doing here, but you know, you have two, like if I wanted to put a number in scientific notation, two times, use your exponent key. It's just a teensy bit more work, but it's kind of fun. That's, do you see what I'm saying, Megan? I want things to look like that, not like that. Now the equation editor is not hard to use at all. You can intuitively figure it out in 50, 15 seconds, okay? But, but make sure your math looks nice so I can read it right, okay? Okay, um, in any case, uh, let's talk next about the homework. The homework's a huge, important part of this class. Now, we have an official textbook for this course. Those of you who want to follow along, it's called the, Wils uh, sorry, it's called the uh, Cosmic Perspective by Bennett Donahue et al. And there is a complete textbook of the Cosmic Perspective. You guys need the, the half edition that's for the solar system, okay? This is a great book and it will provide lots of extra details that I'm gonna be lecturing on. It's also expensive. Um, we have to do our homework out of this book. So what I've been doing so that you guys can follow along with the pages if you don't have the textbook is in our Blackboard, let's look at uh, the homework that we're gonna be doing for next class. So we have homework to each class, each and every class you have a homework assignment. Five problems, some of them are mathematical, some of them are essay questions. Um, you go to the homework session, 
homework number one, five problems from chapter two in this book. And I've scanned the page that has the questions here. So you can see our first question is chapter two, number 44. And that question will say, new planet in our solar system has a circular orbit and an axis tilt of 35 degrees. Would you expect this planet to have seasons? If so, yes, why? Uh, if not, why not? That's a question that you'd write a little paragraph for. Um, other questions like maybe this question, which I'll be asking you, is to calculate the diameter of the sun based on its angular size. Now, this is stuff you do not know how to do right now. It's stuff that I am going to be training you to do during the course of our lectures. But one thing I've learned over the years is even if I provide you with exactly the right training, I tell you what the equation means and I tell you how to use it, it still turns out that doing these problems can be really, really tough your first time around. Sometimes you won't even understand what the question's asking you to do, much less how to go out and do it. And that tends to cause a huge amount of stress for students because you're responsible to do this big homework assignment each class. It's confusing as hell. It's difficult to get through at night when you're tired. So at some point I figured out a better way. Um, rather than you guys trying to do it on your, rather than you guys trying to do it on your own, which is gonna be a bad experience in which you're gonna do it badly, and then I'm gonna get real pissed off trying to grade your papers. Instead, I discovered that it was way more effective and fun and just easy if we all do the homework together, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be here before class, each class for two hours, and I am going to walk you through all five of your homework problems. I'm gonna tell you exactly how they should be done. We're gonna make them perfect. They'll become perfect little study guides for you. And that's so cool for you because instead of doing it at home at night when you're tired and you're lonely and you're miserable, we'll do it as a group together in a community. And if you do it with me, not only will you get it done more correct, you will also get it done faster than you would do on your own. So either way, you're gonna be stuck doing this homework if you're gonna make it through this course. You might as well do it with me, the expert who knows what they want to see. And believe it or not, you actually learn more doing it in a group than you do on your own. Yes, uh, it seems like that adds some extra time to our class. It certainly does. But by all means, if you would prefer to do your homework on your own, then you are free to go and do that, okay? But you may find that it's not such a good experience. So if you ask me, it's a good deal. It's me doing your homework with you. Me, hell, I'm doing your homework for you. You just gotta show up and be there and copy it all down, all right? You can't beat that deal. So from now on, for every class, we are gonna meet a little after 10 o'clock before class starts to do the homework. Since you have five problems due next time, I will give you the Zoom link at somewhere between 10 and 10.15. I'll send out the link. We'll all log in. I'll march through each of the problems. Now, most people get on board with this because they see the value of it right away. If you don't, then you still are obligated to get a homework into me. And if you start getting zeros or you start turning in crappy homeworks, that can really negatively affect your grade. And I'd like to see that not happen. See, because after labs and after homeworks, there's really only one other way to earn points in this class. And that's through a big, scary test. Uh, hold on, guys. My mouse is kind of dying here. Let me get back to Blackboard for a second. Wow, my mouse is acting real buggy. Hold on a sec, guys. I can't tell if it's... Wow, that was all Internet Explorer. Did you see that? Internet Explorer is a virus, okay? It is a virus. That's what it is. As soon as I closed that program, my mouse started working again. That's crazy. All right. Um, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. I was looking for my slideshow. That's what I was doing. So we're going to have... Come on, baby, work for me here. All right. Homework is worth a quarter of your grade. And labs are worth a quarter of your grade. In a normal class, had you taken this course during the fall or spring semester, 
there would be one midterm worth 25% of your grade and one final worth 25% of your grade. However, um, in, in a summer course where we have very limited time together, and because the tests are really long and grueling, what I did last summer class that I think worked out pretty well is we just did one test. We did a midterm halfway through the semester. It was long and brutal and it sucked, but I just used that for both midterm and final. And for your final exam, instead of doing a final, we all just had another lecture and another homework where we relaxed and we learned about another cool thing in space. It basically means more time learning cool stuff about astronomy and less time being stressed out taking tests. Every single person in both classes loved it and was on board with it. And hopefully you guys will see the wisdom of it too. If for some reason you wanna take another 100 question astronomy exam, I'll be happy to furnish you with one. I've got a copy in my back pocket. But I think one exam is gonna be enough for all of us. It just means less bad times and more good times, okay? It does mean, however, that that one test kind of counts for a lot. So the good news is this. If you show up to all the labs and you show up to all the office hours and you do all of your homeworks and labs, which I will tell you how to do, it won't actually matter what you get on the test. You'll still pass the course with flying colors. So it is impossible to fail the course. Like you won't even get a D. I think it's impossible to get the D if you do all the labs and all the homeworks, you, are, you could get a zero on the exam and still get a C. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's a good thing, because that means we can just spend time hanging out together and talking, and then you can just relax and watch astronomy TV. You see what I'm saying? You can, you can learn good things that way when you're not stressed out. So that's our plan. Most important thing is I wanna make sure that each and every one of you are planning on coming to those office hour sessions. They are critical to making sure that you don't get a bad grade in this class, okay? All right, hopefully you all understand what I'm saying here. Um, thank God I'm not an art teacher, okay? I don't have to look at your crappy little sculpture at the end of the semester and say, B minus, you know, I'm not making this stuff up, guys. Your grade is a number. You have to move around the board, the Monopoly board, and put points into these slots and once all the points are in the slots, I'm gonna hit the computer program button and then out comes your grade. You determine your grade by how many points you put in there. My goal is to help you get as many points into the slots as possible. And I can do that if you show up and hang out with me. I can't do that if you blow me off. Okay, that's my spiel on, uh, on the class and how it works. Are there any questions about that or is that reasonably transparent? I just have one question. Yes. Um, so for the um, the homeworks and stuff like that, if we print them out, do we like take pictures of them and send them to you? Or is it, I think, I don't know if I missed that. Yeah, no, I, I didn't quite explain that. So that's a good point. Um, here's what usually happens. And this is this happens for both the labs and the homeworks. For the homeworks, I do the problems on the board and you kind of copy them down into your notebook. And then what you do at the end is you take out your cell phone, you snap, a picture of it okay. um, that's one way you if you have a scanner that's kind of fancy you can scan it with a scanner but if you don't this works fine okay you take a picture of it and you can upload it to blackboard right from there now I believe um, just for those of you who haven't done this before if uh, uh, Olivia and everyone watch me here let's say we were turning in homework one right um, when you guys go in here you can hit browse my computer and then it'll let you choose the file. And I think you can even do this right from your phone. There is one thing I gotta say. Most people tend to have either an iPhone or an Android. And some of the phones use these new super high definition photographs. Um, if you have an iPhone, you're gonna have to go into your settings and change your camera settings to most, you know, they don't actually tell you what the extensions are, but if they, if they have highest quality, the, the photo extension is like an H-E-I-C. I can't read that, so you can't submit that to me. You have to submit me a JPEG, and you have to go with most compatible. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? If you have an iPhone, I'll walk so. you through this today. At the end of our, our lab today, when it's time to submit, I'll walk you through that. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Um, so so the extensions I can read. We got to make this really clear, actually, because this was a huge issue for my last two classes. I can read... 
a JPEG, I can read a PDF. I can also read a dot doc, but that's about it, okay? If you don't submit me one of the formats I like, if I cannot read it, I will give you a zero until you get it straight, all right? Um, no, no zip files or anything like that. You, can I just show you guys, maybe this will help. Here's how you know you got it right. Let me go to one of my other courses and just show you a random person's submission so you can see what's happening here. So let's go to our solar system class from last semester, okay? Uh, oh, I probably don't have anything in the needs grading center. Oh, I do, cool. Thank God there's a slacker out there, okay? So let's just look at, let's look at this slacker here who didn't turn in his homework on time. Zachary, if you're listening, you're a slacker, okay? And I'm not even sure if I'm gonna accept it. All right, see, this sucks. This is what I, he's not only a slacker, but he gives me crap formats that I don't wanna see. This box should open up and should show you a little preview of what you're seeing. This is extremely irritating for me because it'll take me outside of Blackboard, but at least he got me a picture I can read. But please don't do this. Like, there's a way to upload it so that it appears as a preview in the box, and that helps me grade it faster. Maybe at the end of lab today, a couple of you could try submitting it and we can look and we can see if it's looking right. Then you guys will have a sense of what looks good from my perspective and what doesn't. In any case, Libby, that helps answer your question a bit, right? Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. All right, cool. Um, let me show you something else that's on Blackboard. Um, there are uh, some lecture notes that you might make use of here. Wow, I'm using up a lot of time. I should get going here. Uh, if you go to the section on lecture notes, I've provided you with some crappy little, wait, are you guys seeing, am I sharing my screen with you? No, I'm not. Let's try that again. All right. Um, let me try that again. Uh, if you go to these lectures, today's lecture is lecture zero and lecture one. And when you click on these, you'll see a little crappy Roman numeral outline of the things I'm going to talk about today. So I just did lecture zero. I wanted it to take a half an hour. It looks like I took over an hour. So that's classic me. Okay. I'm going to try to work on that. Um, like never. All right. So uh, the other uh, lecture that we're going to do now, the actual astronomy lecture is where you start to learn some stuff. And these handouts are not all inclusive study guides, but it can give you a sense of some of the things I want to talk about. Sometimes uh, there's a nice diagram or you can see conversion factors that we're going to need. Okay, so, so keep in mind you can follow along what I'm doing with those and that'll help give you some top-down structure. Meanwhile, we want to get into our class today. We want to talk uh, about some astronomy stuff before tea break hits us. So let's go into our, our first lecture on the nighttime sky. Um, <clears throat> this is a famous constellation. Anyone know what it is? Adrian? Orion? Is it Orion? Oh, sorry. Whoever said that, yes, there's Orion. You can tell so uh, by the three stars that make up his belt. This is the bright red star Betelgeuse. That's his shoulder. He's kind of a hunter constellation, right? Looks like this. He's got some legs down here. This is a famous star called Rigel. This is the sword of Orion that hangs down from the belt. That's the Orion Nebula. Um, you can't see Orion at all times of the year. You can see him in the winter time and in the late autumn. He will not be up tonight. In fact, the sun is pr reasonably close to Orion in our sky right now. So Orion is probably up during the daytime. For you guys to take your first steps into the world of astronomy, you need to be able to understand how the nighttime sky rotates how it rotates on a daily basis, how it rotates over the course of the year, how where you are on Earth will affect what stars you can see. You also have to learn how to talk to me about stars because there's, there's a way to do this, okay? Um, and, and these are things you're going to be learning uh, class after class, but we're going to get started here today. Some vocabulary terms really help because the, the vocabulary terms help us to have an intelligent discussion and make sure we can talk about the same thing. So let's start by just going over some basic stuff about big numbers. Obviously, astronomy has to do with very large things. The Earth seems big to you. And the Earth is one of several planets that are in our solar system. Um, our solar system consists of the sun, 
the eight planets, Mercury through Neptune. There's also a couple of dwarf planets. Ceres is the king of the asteroids. Um, Pluto and Eris are dwarf planets in the Kuiper belt. The solar system consists of the sun, the planets, the dwarf planets, some asteroids, some comets, a little bit of dust. Where are we when we leave the solar system? Well, there are obviously other stars out there, right? There are other solar systems, and they're all assembled into a vast structure called the Milky Way galaxy. And the Milky Way galaxy contains the sun in our solar system, and it contains a myriad of other stars and planets as well. In addition, the Milky Way galaxy also contains a tremendous amount of gas. Gas is a big part of any galaxy. Um, this is an artist illustration of the Milky Way. Do you guys understand why I'm not showing you a picture of the Milky Way? Why can't I show you an actual photograph of the Milky Way galaxy? Too big? Yeah, we're like inside of it, right? For the same reason a ladybug cannot see the entire forest when she's sitting on a leaf. It's, it's too big of a structure. We don't have enough time to leave the thing. We do have pictures of other galaxies, so we have a sense of what they must look like. Maybe one of the most famous of, of all the galaxies. Uh, I don't understand why it does this sometimes. All right, here we go. Our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, is probably similar to what our own Milky Way looks like. We can see Andromeda because we're not inside of it. Here's a lovely, lovely, lovely 3,000 pixel image of the Andromeda galaxy. So our, our Milky Way probably looks something like this. Now there are a lot of stars that make up the Milky Way galaxy. And because we have to deal with big numbers like this all the time, it's a good meditation point for us to start out learning about big numbers. So let's do your first lesson right up here. Your first lesson is on something called, excuse me, scientific notation. Scientific notation is how we write about big numbers. Let me kind of bring this in a little bit. I think that'll help you guys. Um, let me know if this thing starts going in and out of focus. Okay, Ooh, that's good. All right, so let's talk about the number of stars in the Milky Way. The number of stars in the Milky Way is damn close to one trillion stars. Now, Tim ought to know the answer to this question, so he should pipe down for a moment. The rest of you guys um, need to get tortured a bit. So how many of you besides Tim know how many zeros are in a trillion? Or take a guess if you don't know. Trillion? Um, 12? Yes. Yes, very good. Okay, you have guessed wisely, if that was a guess. All right, so let's write that down together. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve stars. That's what most people would consider to be a big number. If you had a trillion dollars in your bank account, you would probably be a happy person, okay? Uh, notice you put commas after every three zeros. That's just customary. That's good style. On the other hand, I want to show you guys something. Let's take out our Casio calculators. If you have your Casio, I'd like you to follow along with me here. I just want you to do something dumb. I want you to type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. That's it. That's 10 digits that you can work with on your calculator. This one is 13 digits long because of the one, right? 
So you can't type that number into your calculator. You need a better method to deal with big numbers. And that method is called scientific notation. Scientific notation is going to make use of the fact that you can pack all of these zeros into a power of 10. For instance, let me remind you some stuff you might have forgot about. 10 uh, to the power of 1 is basically 10 times 1. It's just 10. One, it's 110. 10 squared is 10 times 10. That's two 10s multiplied. That's obviously 100, right? And 10 cubed means 10 times 10 times 10. That's 1,000. In fact, when you think about it, every time you raise 10 to a power, that sort of tells you how many zeros you have in your number. 10 to the 4, for instance, is a 1 followed by four zeros. It's 10,000. And 10 to the 5 is 100,000. Why don't you guys try it? What's 10 to the power of zero? One. Very yeah. good. It's one because you have no tens and it just leaves the one behind. Anything raised to the power of zero is one. That's kind of like a rule in math. All right, now that we remember how our powers of 10 work, it seems reasonable that we might be able to pack this number into a power of 10 in the following way. I'm going to define this number as the lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number. It can only be between one and nine. No zero, no 10, just the first number in your number that's not zero. This section is, um, it's the number of zeros. Sometimes we have a phrase for this. This is like how big your number is. We call it the order of magnitude. The order of magnitude tells you the size of your number, how many zeros wise it is. Is it a number of order 1,000? Is it a number of order 10,000 or 100,000? And lastly, we have a little tag called the unit. The unit is critical because the unit tells you what it is you are measuring. I'd like to point out to the class that any number that exists, whether it's the number of teeth in your head or the number of dollars in your bank account, all numbers are measurements, and ultimately most of them have units associated with them. All right, so here's how scientific notation works. By the way, I'm just, how many of you show of hands have used scientific notation before or learned it? That's almost everyone, okay? Well, that's good. That means this ought to go smoothly, all right? I hope. <laughs> so uh, we write down our lead digit, our power of 10 is 12 because there's 12 zeros. And then we write down the word stars. This is how you write a trillion in our class. One times 10 to the 12th. Because this comes up so often, we have a special method of typing this in in our Casio. And if you have your Casio, I want you to follow along with me. We are going to use the EXP key for all scientific notation operations. Write this down in your notes. EXP stands for times 10, okay? The times 10 is included in the EXP. So what I type, if I wanna type a trillion, is I type one EXP 12. Do you see how it displays it there? One with a little power of 12. The calculator does not write in the times 10 because the calculator doesn't have time for the times 10. It doesn't have enough space for it, okay? You're supposed to be able to translate from calculator back into scientific notation. In other words, you are not allowed to write one to the power of 12 on your paper. That's not fair, okay? So here's what you do. This, this is what you write, what you 
type is one exp12. And this is what you see. You see one to the power of 12. But when you write it down, you must put the times 10 back in. That's critical because if you were to write down over here, if you were to write down one to the power of 12, the way you see it on your calculator, unfortunately for you guys, I speak math and I'm going to, I'm going to interpret that differently than you meant it. Do you guys know what one to the power of 12 is? One. Yeah. One to the power of 12 means one. That's how I would read that. It means a one multiplied by itself 12 times. That's not the same thing as a trillion. So I would actually mark that wrong if it was a homework assignment, okay? So you're obligated to put the times 10 back in. To help with some of these issues, now it sounds like you guys already kind of know some of this stuff, but to make sure that we're all on the same page because we need this skill, you guys are going to spend your first labs just solving some problems with me in scientific notation. One, so that I can make sure you can handle it, and two, just to give you guys some practice with the way I want you to start punching things in. You may have had your own method of doing this in some other class, but we're all gonna conform to my method for now. That's gonna help things go smoothly, okay? And you, with time, you will learn the wisdom of my methods and you will, you will appreciate them, I'm sure of it. Um, let's just try one more example and save the rest for lab, okay? Because I know this stuff isn't exactly thrilling to learn about. So um, let's just take one more random number <clears throat> Let's take a number like nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Do you guys know how to say that number in English? I just want to know what I'm working with here, guys. And if, if someone can read this number to me besides Tim, then then I'll know. I'll know that you guys understand some things. I can always choose a volunteer. Nine million eight hundred thousand. Oh wait, right. Okay. Not million though, right? Yes, trillion. No, 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 no. Wait, who am I talking to right now? Because I, I. Sorry, I'm just throwing answers out. I didn't even observe. Well, no, 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 Jennifer. That's exactly. That's the spirit. That's what I want to hear. Okay. Jennifer, sorry, your, your face was just tucked away. Um, where are you? Uh, there you are. Okay. So, uh, Annabelle, let's try this, right? So this, this is the marker for thousands, right? Mm -hmm. This is the marker for millions. And after millions comes billions, okay? So try again. Jennabelle, you still down? I'm here. I just wanna like, I'm processing in my head before I say it out loud. Oh, sure, sorry. That's okay. Okay, so nine trillion. Nope. Okay. I'll pass the torch to somebody else. Okay, all right, yeah. Someone rescue her. Nine right so that obviously that's an annoying thing to say we won't be saying we're going to deal with numbers of this size all the time but we won't necessarily deal with all these digits so let's talk about this um what's our lead digit here nine, nine. yeah so when we want to pack this into scientific notation we take our lead digit we write down the nine and we put a decimal point after it. So obviously this number is different than the, the previous example because not all of the other numbers are zero, but we're gonna treat them like they were zero. We're gonna notice that the decimal point started there and we're gonna wanna slide the decimal point until we have a single lead digit between one and nine. And since that's nine, I wanna slide my decimal place one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places. Now, this other stuff I'm going to keep as leftover change, okay? And maybe I'll just start by keeping it all. 9.8765432.1. You don't need to keep the zero. 
times 10 to the power of, what did I slide again? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, this is how you would write that number in scientific notation. That's kind of weird because it looks like this number is actually more confusing and more long than that number. But the issue is that this part of the number here, this part of the number is called the precision. Spelling eludes me sometimes. And this is called the order of magnitude. Okay? Oftentimes in astronomy, we do not need to deal with all of these digits of precision because our measurements are actually not that precise. They're not that good. So what we can do is we can use rounding rules. And one good rule of thumb for our class is when in doubt, round to two significant figures. In other words, I want to keep this one and I want to keep this one, but I have to, I have to use proper rounding. And the rounding rules go like this. If I'm going to chop a number there between the eight and the seven, if the very first digit is greater than five, I have to increment the last digit that I keep, right? So since it's 9.8... I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Ask again. Yes. Or, can you repeat that again? The last few things you just said. Yeah. So, Janabelle, I, I probably could have said that in a less egg-heady way that made more sense. If you're going to cut a number there between the eight and the seven, you have to look at the digit just to the right of the cut, and you have to ask yourself, is that digit five or more, or is it less than five? If it's five or more, you increment this number to 9.9. .9. So since seven is more than five, I round it as 9.9 .9 times 10 to the nine. But just to make that perfectly clear, Janabelle, if instead of this being 9.87, if it was 9.84, 9.84, I would have left it at 9.8, okay? Thank you. You think about it as, uh, some, one way that I think about it is I think about it like change in dollars and cents. If you have 87 cents, and you're gonna round 87 cents to the nearest dime, obviously 87 cents is closer to 90 cents than it is to 80 cents, right? So if you, if you round up, you have to round it, or if you're rounding off, you have to round to $9.90, okay? Um, this number could be read as 9.9 .9 billion, and that's nice, okay? From now on in our class, we are gonna have a very important rule. Our rule goes like this. Any number which is greater than 1 million or 10 to the power of 6, okay? Any number greater than 1 million must be, be written in scientific notation. That's a really important rule in our class from now on. Okay? You guys have all that down? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one last little thing before we take our break here. Uh, sometimes it takes a while for you guys to catch up because you're listening to me and you're writing at the same time. So I'm gonna kinda ask everyone if they're done I guess you gotta be good at being vocal. Let me know if you still need a moment to copy this stuff down. I'm looking around at your faces. It looks like everybody's good, all right? All right, you can always give me a thumbs up too. That helps. All right, so I'm gonna erase and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one more thing here. Let's make a little chart of some common powers of 10 so that you know the thing that happened with me and Janibal there where we were doing million versus trillion? This is designed to help fix that in the future. So let's make a little chart of some common powers of 10. Love making charts. 
there'll be three columns and there will be after the header maybe four four rows or so okay so this is the name of my number this is 10 to the power of x whatever it is and then this is going to be our metric prefix. We're going to be using metric units in this class. That's customary in any science class. So you guys have already learned that a trillion is 10 to the power of 12. Okay. A billion is nine zeros. That's 10 to the power of nine. A million has 10 to the six zeros. A thousand is 10 to the power of three. Trillions, billions, millions, and thousands kind of come up all the time in this class. Do you guys know any of the metric prefixes for these things? Like we could start with the metric prefix for a thousand. Tim, why don't you help remind them what the metric prefix for a thousand is? I'm putting you on the spot there. I don't know if you know. Kilo? Yeah. It's a kilo. Anyone besides Tim know the prefix for a million? <laughs> Guess you all don't know as much scientific notation as thought you did, huh? Okay, fine. Uh, a million is a mega. A billion is a giga, like if you have a gigabyte of storage, you have a million bytes. And a trillion is a tera, okay? This is a wicked, awesome, helpful chart that will help you keep your brain straight. When I say million, if you can't remember how many zeros that is, you can look up here at my chart, okay? okay. Um, you guys ready for a little break? You've been listening to me talk for a while. Okay. It's 1.38. Let's say at 10 past two, we will resume. That'll give you a nice good half an hour to like chill out, have a snack, Slap your face with water, whatever you got to do, okay? Um, I'll drink some tea. Now, listen, during tea break, here's what I do, because this is your first time doing this, so let's talk about it. I leave my video on, uh, but I mute myself so that you don't hear background clatter. But I'm usually around, you know, like either I'll be over here fiddling or setting up a lab. Sometimes I'm just over there in the kitchen having a snack. And if you guys want to talk to me about stuff during tea break, sometimes people want to ask me, all kinds of wacky stuff, you know, or normal stuff. It could be anything. Um, I'm around and I'm down to chat. So most of the time though, I'm just kind of munching a sandwich and looking at the New York Times or something. So I'll be here if you guys need me during tea break. One thing that's important is I don't want to keep the tea break in the recording because then that's just empty air. So I'm going to pause the recording, but we need to remind me to start the recording. I got a little slip of paper that says hit record. Hopefully that'll do the job, okay? But if you guys see me forget to unpause the recording, let me know. Hello everyone, welcome back. Destiny, nice of you to join us. We can see your face, that's good. Um, so we're gonna do the second part of our lecture. Then we're going to do a lab. I'm a little concerned because I, I took a little bit of time in explaining the setup of the class. I was a little slow. I, I took too much time. So uh, <clears throat> I may have to squeeze a little extra lecture in. I promise I'll try to get us done here by four o'clock or so. So I may just snip some edges off the lab because there's two or three more modules I need to give you so that you're ready to do your homework with me next time on Wednesday at 10 o'clock. So without further ado then, let's get into that. I wanna teach you guys a little bit about the orbit of Earth.
if you'd like to follow along with uh, <clears throat> our slideshow here, you can obviously just watch my screen. But um, in slideshow one, I've got some very helpful slides that you can look over from time to time having to do with the orbit of Earth. And I'd like to just start, uh, kind of just show you, oops, excuse me, maybe show you this picture here. So let's take a look at, at how the Earth moves around the sun. The Earth has a primary orbit that takes about one year, and it's kind of orbiting around the sun, if you look from above the solar system, in a counterclockwise fashion. And the Earth is also spinning on its axis in a counterclockwise fashion. So if I have my globe here, we can see that um, seen from the North Pole, where you guys are situated, the Earth is doing a counterclockwise spin. And it's also making this yearly journey around the sun. And we have different vocabulary terms for each of those things that we want to discuss. So let's call that section uh, Earth's orbit. Earth, of course, has an axis spin, and the axis spin uh, gives rise to a day. Sorry. One day is equal to 24 hours. You're going to notice that I'm going to provide you guys with a whole bunch of conversion factors. That's what this is. This is an example of a conversion factor. A conversion factor lets you relate one set of units, like days, to another set of units like hours. Obviously, most of you know that there's 24 hours in a day. If not, you've got problems, okay? But these conversion factors are worth writing down, even if you do know them, so that you can see what my abbreviations are for each of the units, and you can get a sense of how we'll be using these conversion factors very often in our class. Earth also has an orbital period. The orbital period gives us one year. One year is 365 days. Notice that I use little d for days. You should follow all of my abbreviations to the letter, all right? If you look from space, the axis spin and the orbit of Earth are both counterclockwise. And I'm going to make a funny kind of argument with you guys. In outer space, counterclockwise is defined as east. Notice that I've made use of my triple equal sign operator. The triple equals means it is defined as, so do not argue about it. Um, the reason why this is actually good sense is a little bit difficult to explain. If you guys look at my Earth here, you can see the West Coast here, and you can see the East Coast here. So right now, East is sort of pointing in that direction. If I spin the Earth 180 degrees, or yeah, 180 degrees, now the United States is in front of me, and East is pointing in the other direction. But if you think about the continuous turn of Earth, Earth is rotating in eastern direction. Earth rotates in the direction of Rhode Island and away from the direction of the west coast. So in space, we usually define anything in the direction of Earth's north pole. That's north in space. Anything in the direction of the south pole is south in space. But, but for east and west, we use counterclockwise and clockwise. Kind of a weird concept. So from now on, when we talk about rotation, Rotation in outer space has a direction. Counterclockwise is east. That means I can describe Earth's journey along its yearly orbit as an easterly motion. So I would say that Earth travels eastward. Now, this circle that makes up Earth's orbit is kind of like a key concept, and it'd be nice to have a vocabulary term for that. It's called the ecliptic. And here's a picture of the ecliptic. Um, we have the orbit of Earth. We see its axis tilted by the infamous 23.5 degrees. And we can see that Earth is traveling along a dark blue circle, its orbital path called the ecliptic. There's a couple of different definitions for this. I want to get them down. Okay. 
introducing a new vocabulary word, the ecliptic. This is definition number one. It's the simpler of the two. It is the path of Earth around the sun. We'll keep the definitions really simple. It's the quasi-circular path of Earth around the sun. In addition to defining the ecliptic, I can also talk about the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is a two-dimensional surface that the ecliptic traces out. Let's take a peek at that again. Here you can see the light blue sheet is the ecliptic plane. One of the reasons it's important to define this ecliptic plane is it lets us orient ourselves in the solar system. For instance, it turns out that most of the planets in our solar system orbit within one or two degrees of the ecliptic. Not perfect, but pretty damn close. Orbital inclinations of the planets. Let's look at a little diagram there and you get a sense of it all. So the solar system is close to, but not quite a, a perfect disk, all right? We define Earth and the sun as making up the ecliptic plane. And you can see that like Jupiter's off by about a degree, Neptune is off by maybe two degrees, Venus is off by three degrees, Mercury and Pluto are pretty extreme. Mercury's off by seven degrees, which is kind of high. And Pluto's 7 degree in, 17 degree inclination is very extreme. But for the most part, there's a reason why the planets tend to fall within a very narrow range of the ecliptic. It has something to do with the way the solar system formed. That's not simply random. There's meaning behind that. In other words, you can think of the ecliptic plane as kind of like the plane of the solar system. Or let's write the disk of the solar system. That's how I would think of the ecliptic plane. Uh, <clears throat> there's another way to look at the ecliptic too. This one's a little bit more abstract. If I were to orient myself so that I was looking at Earth from the outside and Earth's North Pole was pointed up, then you can see that the, the Earth kind of makes some alignments with the outside celestial sphere. This line will become important to us later. It's called the celestial equator. It's the projection of Earth's equator onto the sky. Now I can see the ecliptic in a different sort of way. It now becomes a ring, which is tilted by 23.5 degrees with respect to the equator. This ring no longer represents the path that Earth makes around the sun, but this is now the path that the sun takes against the background stars in our sky over the course of one year. Let's try writing that down. This is the ecliptic definition number two. It's the path of the sun against the background stars over a year. And I have to say over one year because I don't want you to confuse it with the daily motion of the sun, which travels, rises in the east and sets in the west. Uh, does this remind you of something that we talked about at the beginning of our lecture today? The path of the sun against the background stars? What's that sound like? Who's got a memory? Uh, the astrology section. Yeah. And what do we call that, that path, those constellations? They've got a particular name, don't they? Someone knew it earlier. Zodiac? That's right, the zodiac. This is the idea, guys. The ecliptic is the zodiac.
Write that down. When I look up at the nighttime sky, you know, uh, nobody was kind enough to paint the ecliptic onto the sky for me. It's, it's not there, it's invisible. So when I look up at the nighttime sky, I can orient myself and see where the ecliptic is by looking for zo zodiacal constellations. If I see Taurus, if I see Capricorn or Sagittarius, I think, aha, that's the disk of the solar system. And that's where I'm likely to find planets like Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. So I would never expect to see Mars in Orion or the Big Dipper because those aren't on the Zodiac, right? Lastly, but not leastly, the Earth's axis is tilted by 23.5 degrees with respect to the plane of the ecliptic. And that's also an important noteworthy point that's going to play a big role in our lectures. Let's write that down here. Earth has an axis tilt. The axis tilt of Earth is 23.5 degrees with respect to the ecliptic point. As soon as I teach you a fancy vocabulary word, I'm going to start employing it and using it. That could be challenging. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna erase this stuff down here, guys, so shout at me if that's an issue. Here's another thing. We should talk about how we measure distances. So let's talk about metric units of distance, because obviously I'm going to want to start talking to you about the distances from Earth to other things. The standard metric unit of distance is called a meter. Uh, you're going to use these in your office hours and in your labs. So here's my meter stick. It's kind of like a yard, but better. It's big enough that I can't, well, I'd have to go back here to hold it up in front of the screen. All these markings that you see here, these are centimeters, 40 centimeters, 41, 42 centimeters. Them tiny little tick marks, thems are millimeters, okay? So let's learn about the metric units, all right? So the standard unit is one meter. Its abbreviation is lowercase m. Um, one meter contains 100 centimeters. One centimeter contains 10 millimeters. And that means there are 1,000 millimeters in a meter. When we want to measure distances around a planet, meters will not do. That's when we can use kilometers. A kilometer is going to be one of the more frequent measurements that we use in our class. I want you guys to put a box around this conversion factor. One kilometer equals 1,000 meters. Put some stars next to it. You're going to want to remember that. Um, <clears throat> when Earth orbits around, when Earth orbits around the sun, sorry, let me try this here. Its orbit is not quite a perfect circle. The circle is a little bit squished or elliptical. That means there's a time during Earth's orbit where it's a little bit closer to the sun, perihelion, and there's a point in its orbit where it's a little bit farther from the sun. And that point is called aphelion. These are important vocabulary terms in this course. So let's define perihelion 
that is closest point to the sun in orbit. And it could be the orbit of every planet, or any planet, rather. An aphelion farthest point from the sun in orbit. Hey class, if you had to guess one out of the 12 months, which month would you guess that perihelion occurs in? If you had to just take a random guess. Autumn. That would seem to make sense, wouldn't it, Adrian? What if I told you that perihelion happens in July, uh, in January? That's pretty weird, right? This is in January. I think aphelion takes place in July. Ain't that weird? It turns out that the changing distance between Earth and the sun has nothing to do with the change of temperature that we call seasons. It's not about distance. It's actually about axis tilt. And one of your first homework problems is about this. We'll get to that in a second. But meanwhile, I'd like to do something. I'd like to define the average distance between Earth and the sun as a new unit of measurement called an astronomical unit. I'm going to erase here because I need all my board back. Any objections? Okay, this is an important concept and it should be new for most of you. Introducing the astronomical unit, also known as 1AU. 1AU is defined as the average distance between the sun and earth. It has a value of 150 million kilometers. You guys remember that million is six zeros, right? Maybe you can even write that in up above. Hey, didn't we have a rule about big numbers in this class? What was that rule? Hey, Ayanna, did I say that right? What was our rule about big numbers? Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, your mic isn't working. Okay. Well, can you type me what the rule was? Does anyone know what the hell I'm talking about? What am I talking about? I'm confusing some people here. Wait. Um, I wrote it down. Um, it's uh, any number greater than one million must be written in scientific notation. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, who was I talking to just oh. now? Oh, Olivia, okay. Olivia, yeah. um, w when I'm in a lock speaker view, uh, I can only see like a few of you at a time and I can scroll around, but oh, sometimes okay. it just takes me a minute <laughs> to figure out who's talking to me. One, one second here, guys. Uh, I just did something weird and I'm trying to undo it. Okay. Sorry, I was in full screen mode. Okay, uh, let me find you again, Olivia. Let me hunt around for you. There you are. Wait, no, I lost you. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Olivia, what am I going to do then? What am I going to do about this? Um, let's, see, can... let's really make you regret contributing to the class here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So you know that there's a rule that this cannot fly because this is bigger than a million. 
So yes. your job is to put it in the scientific notation. Go. Um, What's your lead digit? One. Okay. Let's write that down. Put a decimal point after it. You want to keep any okay. change? Um, oh, yeah. It's five is the next number. So it is less than, yeah. It's less than, well, it's five. So it's equal or less than five. So it would be, it would stay five. This, this number. The zero. Oh, the zero. Um, yeah. Zero is less than five. So it stays yeah. five. And so now it's times 10, but what's your power? Um, six. Hold on. The decimal place used to be there, right? Yes. But now it ends up between the one and the five, correct? Yes. So how many times do you have to move it to get it there? Seven? No, eight. 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 Sorry. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. Seven, seven, eight. eight. Right? Yes. Yep. So 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers is how you would write that in scientific notation. Oh, okay. That makes sense. You did fine. This, the <laughs> method that Olivia did, this is called proper form. Proper form is the way that most books will write a large number in scientific notation. For instance, if you ever needed to remember one of your conversion factors, you could either go to my lecture handouts or you could go to the book. Shucks. Um, in the back of the book, there's a very helpful appendix called Appendix A. There's also a, a bunch of appendices. A few mathematical skills is kind of interesting. Well, you won't find it interesting, but it's helpful. Here's something that's very helpful useful numbers, you'll notice they have 1 AU is close to 1.496 1. 1. times 10 to the 8 kilometers. That's what I mean by proper form. They usually, proper form of scientific notation tends to look like this. It tends to look like a lead digit followed by some numbers that I call the change because I don't know what to call them, and then times 10 to some power. That's proper form. Now, if you're a little bit of a weirdo like I am, you can play around with proper form and you can slide your decimal place forwards and back, making sure you keep track of your power. For instance, if I wanted to, I could also write this as 15 times 10 to the 7 kilometers. That's where I slid the decimal place back one to there, or sorry, back one to there and I've got seven zeros after me. This is weird, but ultimately it's okay, it's correct. And then if you're really weird, you might even slide back the decimal one more place and write it in the following form. This is how I like to write it. 1 AU is 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. This, my friends, is good math style. It may not be proper form, but it's good style because I've jimmied around my decimal points until I've left myself with six zeros. And in my mind, six zeros is equivalent to a million. I like this form because I can read it in my brain in a nice and easy to understand way. 150 million kilometers. It sounds nice in your head. This is the form you'll see me use very often. 1AU is 150 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. What can you do with an AU? Well, an AU is kind of like a meter stick but it's a really big meter stick that you use to measure out solar system size differences. So for instance, if you wanted to know the distances to the planets, reporting them in meters or even in kilometers would be a very tedious task because they would be millions and billions of kilometers away and those numbers can be hard to remember. Much easier to remember it in AU. For instance, Mercury is about 40% of an astronomical unit. Venus is 70% of an astronomical unit. Mars is 1.5 AU away. 
Jupiter is 5 AU from the sun. Saturn is 10 AU from the sun. Uranus 20, Neptune 30 AU. Pluto is about, oops, 40 AU. I kind of think of the solar system as having a radius. Where's my annotate key here? Come on. I think of the radius of the solar system, just a little bit past Pluto, as being about 50 astronomical units. And maybe it's 100 AU from edge to edge. And that's kind of cute because you can think of the solar system, any distance that you'd want to measure out from one planet to another is usually a number between one and 100. And that's very helpful, OK? So it's, it's a good idea to think of the solar system as having a diameter of 100 astronomical units. Oh, I'm sorry. That should have been 50. I did this wrong. Let's do it right. Here's the sun. Here's Pluto. They're about 40 astronomical units apart. This gives us an opportunity to try a little problem together. The sort of problem that might come up all the time during our lectures. I'm going to erase up top here so I can get some board space back. So here's a question, the kind of question that I might want you to do on a homework or on a test. If Pluto is 40 AU away, then how many kilometers is that? Before I tell you my preferred way to solve the problem, I'd like to see if anyone besides Tim, because Tim has already been trained in my methods, so he knows some things that you guys don't know. But I want to find out what you do know, what you are capable of, would anyone out there besides Tim know how to solve this problem? If they, if, if they were just, what if I just made the entire class just a, just a pop quiz? And I just asked you this one question. You could either get 100 or you could get a zero. How many of you would know what to do? Oh, uh, from the, thank you, Ayanna, uh, from, from the sun. That's, that's an important point. I should have been more clear about that. Ayanna, I guess it would make it 39 AU from the Earth, which is pretty close to 40 anyways, right? Yeah, OK. Um, <clears throat> in any case, does anyone know what to do? Just wanted to see if. If y'all, if y'all have those kinds of skills, you know. Wow. Not all at once, guys. You know, raise your hand or take your turn. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. This is my. I feel like it's too like silly, but um. I like silly. Somehow times it by four. I don't know because. What you times? Wait, what's it? You times what by what? Um, you times um, AU, which is um, 100 and the equation we just did, what 1 AU equals times 40? Uh, yeah, kind of. Ayanna put it nicely in the chat log. She said, would you just multiply? Oh, hold on, Ayanna. You said multiply 40 by 150. But 1AU does not equal 150 kilometers. It equals 150 million. But you guys did get the right idea. And Janabel, you're coming around to the same idea, too. You've got to multiply this 40AU by the number of kilometers in an AU. Now, listen, you guys might have been able to bash your way through that. Some days you have a good day. But we're all going to be confronted sooner or later with complicated problems that are not that easy to think your way through. And even many of you struggled with this one as well. 
I'm going to now teach you a method to solving problems like this. It's a method that we're going to follow each and every time. And it is very critical that you write down this next bit of business that I write on the board. Could be the most important part of this entire course. Okay. Let's understand the question I've asked and let's understand it in a different way. The first is to understand that it's a conversion problem. A conversion problem means that you've been asked to convert some number of one unit, like astronomical units, to another type of unit, like kilometers. So it's similar to converting currency from dollars into euros, okay? And there is a technique that you're going to be using. I don't think there's an H in technique. That doesn't look right either. You know what? Let's just not even write that word down because my spelling isn't good. You are going to use a procedure called dimensional analysis. This is a very important technique that is critical to this course. It's actually critical to life, but you don't know that yet. I'm going to teach you how to do it. Introducing what are known as the four steps of dimensional analysis. Put a big smiley face next to this, because I'm going to want you to find that later when you start getting confused, OK? OK, the first step is to write down the number to convert. So whatever number you've been asked to convert, you're going to write it down with its units. What number would we write down if we wanted to start? 40. That's right. But we wouldn't just write down 40, would we? We'd write down. Who said 40. that? Who said 40? Where are you? Who are you? Megan. Oh, Megan. Wait, I lost you, Megan. There you are. You're at the edge. OK. Megan, I wouldn't just write down 40, I would write down 40 AU. That's right. That matters, OK? Now, the second step is the easiest of all the steps. The second step is you multiply by a division bar. And you do it in exactly this way. You do it times, and then you put a division bar right in between. All right, I'm going to erase these two so I can keep writing them here. The third step is maybe the most important. The third step is you put the units in first to make them cancel out, all right? Now, remember that every number is always part of a secret fraction, whether you recognize it or not. For instance, 40 AU could be considered 40 AU divided by 1. And that means the AUs are currently in the top. They're in the numerator of the fraction. My goal is to put AUs at the bottom of this fraction, because when I do so, the AUs on top whoosh, whoosh, will cancel out with the AUs on the bottom. And because I want to convert from AUs into kilometers, 
I'll put kilometers on top. That's step three right there. It's the most important step. Step four, the last step, put the numbers in second using conversion factors. And that requires us to have a conversion factor from kilometers to AU. We need to have that in our back pocket somewhere. Do we have a conversion factor from kilometers to AU, students? Megan says yes. Iana says yes. What is it? What's the conversion factor? One hundred fifty million kilometer is one equal AU. to one AU. Nice. Wait, who, who was that? Was that Olivia? Oh, who was talking to me just now? Was that Adrian? Yes. Nice. Okay. Sorry. It's, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to learn all your names and the sounds of your voices. Adrian is correct. One AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. Beautiful, all right? So Adrian, why don't we really make you regret chiming in here, okay? Why don't you help me put the numbers in? I need to put one of the numbers on the top and one of the numbers on the bottom. Want to take a guess? Well, the top is 150 times 10 to the power of six. Beautiful, and on the bottom? One. Very good. In other words, she's making sure that this here looks like our conversion factor. She, I'm sorry, he is making sure that we do that. We're keeping the numbers with the units. Very good, okay. Now, we're gonna plug this in using the EXP button on our calculator. EXP button on the calculator. And um, I want you guys to punch just after me. Now look, we're gonna do 40 times 150, we do not need to divide by one because that's a pointless part of the exercise. So let's try that here. 40, punch along with me now. If you have that calculator, you wanna be punching with me. Times 150, shoot, I'm gonna use my backspace key. 150, instead of times 10, watch me now, I hit the EXP key, six equals. Tell me what you get, students who have calculators. Adrian, did you get something? Yeah, I got uh, six times 10 to the 10th power. Count better, you're almost there. Count one more time. I believe you got it correct, but you're translating it wrongly to me. Six times 10 to the ninth power, sorry. That's okay. Let's just make sure everyone sees how that worked. Hold on. Um, so I just wanna go over what happened there. Adrian sees that there's a six with a whole bunch of zeros. And he knows that it's gonna be necessary to count but you have to count real careful, right? Adrian, perhaps you were thinking about the fact that there were 10 spaces here, right? Is that what it was? But remember, the decimal place is gonna stop after the six, correct? So we count, click carefully and slowly, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Killer. But you had the right spirit of the thing anyways. Six times 10 to the nine. Um, Adrian, a couple more uh, pesky, pesky questions. How do I say that in plain English? 10 to the power of nine. Um, Use your cheat sheet that I made for you. I blanked for a second. Uh, plain English? Yeah, like so, what's the word for 10 to the power of nine? A billion. A billion, six billion. What are your units? 
uh, kilometers. Beautiful. Now, once you have it, box it, because that's a classy move. It tells me, the reader, hey, Brendan, this is what I think my answer is. And that's, I need that, okay, because it gets messy. Class, let's have a fireside chat. Dimensional analysis is like a really big deal. It gives you powers that you cannot even begin to imagine. Problems that were once confusing to you, things that stymied you, that kept you from getting correct answers on tests, will now become clear and transparent as glass. If you continue to master this technique, nothing can stop you. You can solve any kind of complex problem. But it's not gonna be obvious to you that that's true yet. This is more important than just astronomy. This is about life and winning, okay? It's about being good at solving problems. Dimensional analysis. I'm gonna make you memorize those steps and you're gonna to have to use them. In fact, I want our work to display this way. One of the reasons why we need to meet for office hours is you guys can't even believe the little things that I care about in the small details. I wanna make sure that when you're turning in homeworks to me, they look good. They look professional, the way a professional would wanna read them, okay? And it's impossible for me to transmit all of that information to you at once. In the future, when we all have USB ports in our brains, then you can pay me the $500 and I'll download the whole thing right to your head in an instant. But for now, it's gonna take time for me to get these little packets out to you. Part of us going to office hours together is so you can learn those little packets, what makes a problem set good. This is one of them right here, using this method to solve every problem. Okay, let's take the remaining time we have. Let's learn a little bit about seasons and let's learn about angles. I've got a couple of fun things to teach you. So now that I've gotten the math bits out of the way, I wanna to talk to you guys about why it is that we have seasons. And I wanna kind of lay out for you what are called four key points in Earth's orbit. Because Earth keeps an axis tilt that's tilted in the same direction, as it orbits around the sun, it's gonna make these different geometrical alignments with the sun. For instance, there will be a day when the North Pole is tilted towards the sun, and that's called the summer solstice. There's a day where the North Pole is tilted away from the sun, that's a summer solstice. Sorry, that's the winter solstice, pardon me. And then there are also spring and fall equinoxes when the axis tilt is sort of at a 90 degree angle with respect to the sun. These make up four key alignments in Earth's orbit. Okay. Four key points in Earth's orbit. These are entirely caused by the 23 and a half degree tilt of Earth's axis. There is the spring equinox. That occurs around March 21st. The summer solstice around June 21st. The fall equinox, also called the autumnal equinox. That occurs around September 21st. And lastly, the winter solstice. Now, I've presented, that's December 21st. I've presented each of these key points, spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, and winter solstice, as occurring on the 21st of these four months. In reality, the date changes, because I don't know if you all know this, but there's not exactly 365 days in a year. Do you guys know how many days there are in a year? Isn't it different like every four years? Because of no, no, it's, it's different by a fraction of the year. 
Okay. It's 365 point. I just didn't know if you guys already knew this or not. You know, part of me right. teaching you is to figure out what you already know, so I don't. Isn't it point 0.4 or? Point, point 0.25, roughly. Okay. Actually, there's different types of year, as you'll discover in our next class. There's a sidereal year and a tropical year. A sidereal year is 0.25. That's why we have, ever heard of leap, you know, leap years? Like my buddy, he was born on February 29th. So he's like, well, he should be like 39, but he's technically four or something like that, right? So I don't, I don't he has a birthday once every four years. So like, you know, he'll be like, hey, I turned six today. You know, it's just funny. Anyways, um, because of that, the dates of the equinoxes and the solstices, they actually drift by a teensy bit um, each year. For instance, this year, the um, summer solstice 2020, which we just passed, actually occurred on Saturday, June 20th. So it was nine days ago. And there's actually an exact time of the solstice as well, but I'm not going to get into that today. I'll deal with that next class. These key points in orbit are related to seasons on Earth. Let's test you guys and see how good you are. Can somebody tell me what day this is here? This is one of the four key points. Can you tell me which one? Who can look at this diagram and understand? What day of the year is this? Andrew, what do you think? I haven't gotten to talk to you yet, Andrew. Hello. Hi. There we go. If you had to take a guess. Can you repeat the question so I can understand it again? Sure. I'm showing you a picture of the Earth right now mm -hmm. relative to the sunlight. In theory, you should be able to tell me which day of the year it is. That might sound crazy, but it's not. You should be able to tell me which day of the year it is based on the geometry of this diagram. Would it be the uh, summer? Like, it would not because, hold on, let me get my globe, Andrew. On the summer solstice, the 23.5 degree axis, like this, is pointed towards the sun. That's the summer solstice. But you can see, Andrew, that the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. So try again. What day of the year is this? Uh, or someone can help him if you think you get it. Um. Would this be the winter solstice? Very good. This is the winter solstice, Adrian. Uh, and you can tell that because the north tilts away from the sun. The southern hemisphere tilts back towards the sun. Okay, now I'd like you to imagine something with me. Imagine, if you will, I'm gonna assert that light, sunlight is a form of energy. And all you gotta do is step outside in a warm, sunny day and feel the sunbeams on your face to know that that's true. Sunlight can make you warm. Imagine that I had two identical beams of light, two identical flashlights, and the diameter of this beam and the intensity of the beam are the same. The only difference is that the first flashlight shines its light down at a perpendicular 90 degree angle, right? And this one is gonna shine down at an oblique angle and splash its sunlight over here like this. Which patch of ground rock do you think is going to be the warmer patch? The patch on the right or the patch, I'm sorry, whoa, I did that wrong. The patch on the right or the patch on the, shoot, the left? Um, the left. Yeah, why would the left patch be warmer than the right patch? Uh, it's more direct. Uh, more direct, but that means that the sunlight is what? What's more different, huh? There's more pressure, more kind of, more compounded together. A pulse to the right is like more spread out. 
Yeah, um, I wouldn't say pressure though. I would say I would say condensed. That's fine. Um, it's the same amount of energy in a smaller area. So, Jennifer, when you said spread out, that's perfect. The, the energy, it's an equal beam of energy spread over a wider. The, the term you are missing is area. It's surface area. Here, the beam is spread out on a minimum surface area, making it warm. Here, it's a larger surface area. Okay, Janelle, so in that case, play a little game with me then, okay? What if we tiptoe back and I have six beams of light on the uh, winter solstice here? Let's label them from the bottom up. This is beam one, two, three, four, five, and six. Can you tell me which beam is gonna be the most effective at heating the ground rock underneath the earth that day? Beam three? Yeah, because three is striking at a perpendicular 90 degree angle, very good. In other words, <clears throat> If I'm on the winter solstice, I would expect that the hottest point on Earth is a latitude of 23.5 degrees. They have a special name for this. They call it the Tropic of Capricorn, all right? This is the most effective area of uh, ground heating. So you've just learned an important rule, and I want you to write it down. Seasons are not caused by the changing distance between Earth and the sun. They're caused entirely by the angle of the sunlight and the axis of it. Let's keep this stupid. Seasons are caused by axis tilt. It has to do with the angle of the sunlight. And we can say that in general, more tilt usually equals more extreme seasons. For instance, in our own solar system, probably the one, one of the planets that has the most intense seasonal variation, the planet Uranus has an axis tilt of 90 degrees. And I think it takes like uh, hold on a second. 89 years, 90 years to go around the sun. So for 45 years, with a 90 degree axis tilt, only the northern hemisphere gets sunlight and the southern hemisphere is in darkness. And at 45 years later, only the southern hemisphere gets sunlight and the northern hemisphere is in darkness. So there's really wild seasonal variations in temperature. Uh, on the planet Uranus. Okay, that's something, by the way, Tim, that's not in 1022, so that's some new stuff for you. Um, let's squeeze a little, t uh, I'm at 303. Normally I would start the lab now, but I'm gonna shave a smidgy widgy bit, a smidgy widgy bit off the lab because there's one more critical module I cover with you. And this is gonna make our homework uh, on Wednesday much smoother, which you guys will eventually appreciate. So let me add one more little bit of notes, and then, um, <clears throat> and then we'll do our lab. Okay, I wanna talk to you guys about a concept called angular size. And I'm here to tell you today that you do not see things for their true sizes, but everything that you see in your field of view is actually an angle. And as an example of this, Perhaps you've had this experience where you've seen the moon rising on the horizon, maybe in October around Halloween, and you see a big creepy orange moon coming up over the uh, horizon of buildings and you say, whoa, check out the moon. The moon is huge. You have been a victim of the moon illusion. The moon seems to be larger when you see it lower in the sky than when you see it higher up in the sky. And the color changes too, which also adds to the effect. When you see the moon along the horizon, it tends to have an orange color, whereas by the time it gets up onto the sky uh, later in the evening, it'll have a kind of pale white color and it won't seem as big anymore. That's because you see things in terms of their angular size. You don't see things um, 
as you don't see the moon as a ball whose diameter is uh, 3,400 kilometers. You see it as an angle on your sky. And it's in the angle, angular size of the moon is about a half a degree. And that's not just true of astronomical objects. That's kind of true of everything, right? Like take little red moon ball here. Little red moon ball has a diameter of about six centimeters. But I don't see moon ball as six centimeters. I see moon ball as an angle. And your camera does too, or the camera that I'm using to talk to you. So if I put moon ball right in front of the camera, it fills up the entire field of view and it blocks everything that you can see. And as moon ball gets farther and farther and farther away, it becomes a tinier and tinier angle in the camera's field of view. The camera field of view, if I'm, I'm, I'm like a mime actor inside of a box, right? This box has an angular field of view. And if I had to guess what it was from the camera's perspective, I've never really tried to measure it before, but I can try. I could take my two meter sticks and I could go out from here, edge to edge. I'd say the camera field of view is not quite 90 degrees, but I'm guessing it's close to a 60 degree, 70 degree field of view. Otherwise known as the cone of neatness. All I have to do is keep my apartment clean to within the 60 degree angle. And for all you know, anything outside of it could also be clean. Those things could be true, all right? Now, um, let's draw a little picture of how this works. It's called angular size. And the symbol that I'm going to use for angular size is the Greek letter theta. Theta looks like a zero with a line drawn through it. And the cartoon picture should look something like this. You've got a circle, that circle represents a moon or a planet or a star or any kind of doodad you want to look at. Your object has a diameter, which I call S. S stands for the size or the diameter of your moon. And it's usually, but not always measured in kilometers. And you're looking at it from some distance away. it subtends an angle in your field of view. So let's draw your eyeball over here. This is you, the observer, who's typically on Earth, all right? The moon has an angular size, which we're usually gonna measure in degrees. And there's also a distance between you and the object. For now, we'll assume that that distance is being measured in kilometers as well. These three things are related to each other by a famous formula in astronomy known as the small angle formula. The small angle formula looks like this. S equals theta times the distance times 2 pi over 360 degrees. This is a key formula in our class. It's a key formula in astronomy that you need to understand how to think. This tells you how to calculate the size of an object based on its angular size and its distance. Normally, I would do this a little bit slower, but I'm kind of squeezing this, squeezing this in at the end here, okay? Can you please repeat that bottom number and the denominator, the denominator please? Um, I'm sorry, whoever, uh, was that Jennifer? Yes. Uh, which part, do you want me the whole just thing? The, just, just the equation, please. Okay, sure. So notice, Jennifer, that what I've tried to do is I've labeled, I've labeled all of the variables up here. Do you see that? Yes. So... So what I'm saying here, but let's do it again. So this is the size in kilometers of your star. 
your whatever, your doodad, right? This is the angle in degrees. That's a little degree symbol. Well, let me ask Janabelle, do you know what degrees are? Have you heard about those before? Yes. Okay, cool. And this is your distance. And that's usually measured in kilometers. So there's your cheat sheet, okay? I'm gonna spell out degrees just in case. Janabelle, anytime I introduce a formula, I normally do a sample problem so you can see how it works. Mm. But I'm, I'm going to skip that today for the following reason. We're all going to be getting together to do our homeworks on Wednesday, correct? Yes. We're going to have to try some problems then, and you'll have my guidance. So in the interest of time, because I'm already kind of busted over my budget, I'm just going to save it for the homework session, okay? okay? I just wanted to get these little bits down, okay? And the last little bit that I want to get down this diagram is important, so I hope you guys reproduce this. It's possible to use different units for your angle. And I'm probably going to have to start off talking about them next time. But I want to at least slap it down, and you guys can remind me to start here next time. Uh, we are going to need this for our office hour session. But in terms of angular size, there are three different units for angle that we are going to use in this class. The standard one is called the degree. And a degree is a, was invented by Greek geometric, geometricians, right? Let me just show you the picture for the degree back here. You take a circle and you divide it up into 360 degree little pizza slices. And each pizza slice is one degree. So usually what you say is one circle contains 360 degrees. That's sort of your conversion factor, okay? Degrees are actually kind of a big and clumsy unit in astronomy. Like for instance, the angular size of the moon happens to be half a degree. And by a curious coincidence, the angular size of the sun is also half a degree. Students, uh, is the sun and the, are the sun and moon the same size as each other? Would you say the sun is the same size as the moon? Does that sound right to you? Which one's bigger? The sun. Then why does the sun seem to be the same size in the sky as the moon? Because it's hot. I don't know. It has to do with heat. Not heat. It has to be closer. The moon is closer, right? The distance matters as well. And that's why um, during certain times of the year, if you're lucky enough, you might get to see the awesomeness that is the total solar eclipse. That's when the moon's disk perfectly covers the disk of the sun and it creates a sort of momentary darkness during the day. This little bit of light that you're seeing is from the outer atmosphere of the sun. It's called the corona, and you will learn about that. Did you know sometimes that eclipses happen where the moon's angular size shrinks a little bit? Those are called annular eclipses, and they're very rare, but also beautiful. It is possible to witness an eclipse in which the angular size of the moon shrinks a little bit because they have slightly different distances over the course of a month or a year. If you happen to have an eclipse when the moon is at its farthest point from the Earth, the angular size of the moon is a little bit tinier than half a degree, and the eclipse looks like what's called a ring of fire or an annulus. Those are very special kinds of eclipses. In any case, the other two units that you'll learn about next time, and I want to save this for next time, is there are smaller units than the degree you can use. They are called the arc minute which is one with a little apostrophe. And the arc second, which is one with a quotation mark. The idea is that we're going to break up degrees, just like we'd break up an hour into 60 minutes and 60 seconds. We're going to break up one degree into smaller bits. So for instance, for an arc minute, 
you take one degree and you divide it up 60 times, right? So you can say one degree is equal to 60 arc minutes. And then you take one of those little arc minutes and you break that up into 60 more pieces and you say one arc minute is 60 arc seconds. Normally I go a little bit slower with that stuff and I should explain this more careful. So guys, put a note in your notebooks. Explain better next time. That's where we'll start our next class. But whatever, I squeezed him in on you. I did that. Okay, uh, normally our labs take at least like a full hour to do or so. Today we're gonna do a restricted lab. As it was your first day, I kind of had some extra stuff to go over with you and I'm trying to keep our class on track, start off good. But it's now officially lab time. Let's do some things together. I'm gonna take you guys over to the lab room, which is the desk right next to me, all right? All right, listen up here. We got a job to do. And that job is this lab, 2-5 from the Wilson Astronomy Lab Manual. Wait, let me get the mouse. I always forget something. Okay, how many people have this printed out? Show me your hands. Nick, I can't see you, so find a way to talk to me. Wait, show, keep those hands up. Oh. And Megan, you do not have this printed, correct? Or do you have a plan? No, but I have a plan. All right. Is your plan's a good plan that won't piss me off, right? I hope so. All right, Nick's got it in Word. <laughs> Nick has it in Word. Word, that's cool, Nick. But Nick, did you get my message about the Word editor, the equation editor? Good. And you understand what I meant by that, right? You're gonna make it look nice for me. Um, who was the other guy? Was it Andrew? What's your plan, Andrew? You got a plan? I'm just gonna hand write them down. All right, that'll do for now, all right? We'll see if we can improve that in the future. There is a way for you to edit in Word. I don't know if that's what Nick is doing. Okay, Nick understands me, that's good. Um, <clears throat> the rest of you, I'm gonna kind of do it in paper and I'm gonna show you as well. Now there's a cool feature of Zoom that I like to make use of. Uh, oh shoot, there's someone who just joined the class. Jeez Louise. Uh, how do I get this damn link? Hold on a second guys. Um, Invite, copy invitation. Guys, just give me a second so I can get this straggler in here. Um, how am I gonna find him? I'm gonna go to my login. Bear with me one sec. For faculty, summary class list. Just sit tight, everybody. I hope he appears here. Yamercy Gonzalez. Okay. Student email address. Copy. Oh, shoot. 
Hold on, guys. Almost got it. Invite, copy invitation. This is irritating. Please don't do this to me. I mean, I, I guess it's the first day and he just joined the class, so I'm trying to take pity, but this is annoying. Control V, all right. By the way, uh, one thing I didn't do during today's class that would have been smart is I didn't kind of show you guys the syllabus. I don't know why I didn't do that. That was super dumb of me. Um, but I want to show you something. Just emailed it. I've given you, you know, it's kind of difficult because we don't have a time where we meet in, in, in a time where you can find me in my office. So I'm trying to give you guys more ways to get in touch with me. And I want to just, I should have done this at some point today, but I got distracted. Uh, let's go to here. And I want to go to our syllabus and schedule. These are the two most important parts of our class. I think I started to show them to you and then I got distracted. Uh, these are ways that you guys can get in touch with me, okay? So um, it has the class, my email address. See that? That's my own personal cell phone number. And if you're reasonably respectful, as I know you will be, you can text me things like this guy. I don't know how he got it, but he texted me and said, hey, I joined your class and I'm trying to get in the Zoom, but I didn't get the email earlier. So that's cool. I can help him get that. Uh, I can help him join the class. Um, more important than the syllabus even would be the schedule for our course. This is kind of important. Uh, in this one, I lay out our entire semester in a gridded a plan. So today you guys already had the lecture on the nighttime sky. We're about to do this lab, measurements and powers of 10. Do you see that? Those are your homework problems for next time. We'll do those together at 10 o'clock on Wednesday, right? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that you guys had found that. I know you're all tech savvy and all that. Okay, uh, one of the features of Zoom is that if things go correctly here, I can share my phone with you if I go onto Wi-Fi. And that'll be helpful because we can do these problems together. Now, this may mean that some of my ding dong friends are gonna send me retarded text messages while we're talking. So hopefully you can ignore those or forgive me for them at least, okay? But um, meanwhile, Let's see if I can share my phone and then we can do the math. All right, who's got the calculators? Who does not have a calculator? Let's start there. Iana does not have a calculator. Um, you've got yours, Adrian? Yeah, use any calculator you can find. Um, Iana, you need to use a calculator for this. So do you have a, like an I? Oh, that'll do for now. Iana, that's perfect for now. It'll be annoying going forward, but use that for now. The equivalent of your EXP key on that calculator, if you can hold it up to me, Ayanna, it's your double E key, which is located, uh, I think it's above the seven. It's in the second function menu. Can you hold your, I wanna go to, yeah, did you find the double E? Okay, so every time I say EXP, you're gonna hit double E. Does that make sense? Cool. Nick, what about you? You got a calculator? Nick's punched out on me. Okay. All right. So be it. Um, Yimmercy is joining us from his phone. All right, guys. Let's see if this doesn't always work, but sometimes I can share my phone. Let's see how this works. Okay, Nick. You have that right one for next class. That's really important. Just give me a second, guys. I'm trying to connect to my phone here. Um, this thing is notoriously glitchy. Half the time it doesn't work. But usually if I keep tinkering with it, I can get it to work. Like right now, for instance, it's not working. Okay, hold on. Yemersi, are you here with us? Oh, 
Oh, Andrew's using the iPhone one for now. That's fine. Okay. Hold on, guys. There's a lot going on here. Let me share to the iPhone first, and now let me try activating screen sharing. Come on, you bastard. I can try holding up the webcam. Oh, here we go. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're in business. All right. Check it out, guys. All right. Can you see that okay? Nice. So let's do the work. The purpose of today's lecture is to make sure that you can handle doing a few basic calculations um, in scientific notation. Now, what we're going to focus on doing is we're going to focus on using our EXP key to solve these problems, okay? Now, you're going to have to turn this in at the end, so follow along with me. Our first question is 2.0 times 2.8 times 10 to the 5. And we're just going to ignore the parentheses for now. This number is in scientific notation. That one's not. So let's just punch together. I want you to punch exactly with me. You're going to have to show me your damn calculators. 2.0 times 2.8 and now we're going to hit exp 6 equals what do you have megan what do you have you'll have to unmute yourself to tell me um i have oh yeah show it vanek uh vanek hold yours right up that's something the uh Yours is too big, Megan. Vanek, hold yours up closer, because you're a little tiny box to me. Vanek, yours is too big, too. What do we do wrong? Is it supposed to be to the power of five and not six? Did I say six? Yeah. Wow. That was last night's whiskey talking right there. Okay. No wonder why. All right. Let's, can we try that again here? So let's do 2.0 times uh, 2.8 exp5 thank you class for correcting me all right so now you better see that show it to me yeah olivia looks good vanek i like what i see now i like how everyone's kind of holding them up that's good okay um oh you're using one of those bad boys uh adrian that's fine um i, I like those too i've still got mine but matthew how about you what's happening with you matthew Um, hold on, a little bit of glare on your screen there. Do you know how to turn up the brightness on that? You hit, um, here, let me show you with my T80. Wait a sec, wait a sec. Uh, let All right, look, I've got one too, but I, I don't know where I put the damn thing. So you hit, I don't know if it's second function. Uh, there's a button up here on, hold your calculator up, Matthew. Hold it up. Uh, closer, yeah. All right, see that, see that yellow key? Yeah. The yellow key, you hit the yellow key, and then you, you hit it, and then you press up on the arrow pad. That should make your screen brighter. You might have to do it a couple of times. Oh, yeah. is, that, is that working? Cool. Now hold it up so I can see what you got. Still glare. Fuck. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> well, why don't you just tell me what it? You know what? Even better. Why don't you tell me what the answer is with your with your words? So I have uh, five hundred and sixty thousand. Okay. Normally, in a normal homework, we wouldn't have to put that into scientific notation, but in today's exercise, uh, Nick, you should have five hundred and sixty thousand, not five point six million. Our goal, Matthew, is to put every single answer into proper form of scientific notation. So I want you to try that, okay? Yeah. Oh, you got it now, okay. So uh, what's your lead digit, uh, Matthew? Uh, five. All right, let's write that down. Let's put a decimal point. Should we keep some change? Uh, yeah. So we point six. Okay. Times 10 to what power? Uh, to the fifth. Good, nice. And then box it, because that's a classy move. That's what I want to see. I don't want to see any intermediate steps. See what they do up here? We're not following the instructions. We're doing it my way. My way is different, OK? All right, let's do it again. 
Now, do you guys see this down here? For those of you who don't have familiarity with scientific notation, let's just take a hot second here to talk to each other about um, negative powers of 10. I think I can hold this up in the tape. The tape kind of works. Does that work? Yeah, okay. So for instance, if I write 10 to the power of negative one, right? That means in math, one over 10 to the one, okay? 10 to a negative power is not a negative number, it's a small number. And that's 0.1, which is a 10th. 10 to the minus two is one over 10 squared. That's what we would call a hundredth, all right? 10 to the minus three, that's one over 10 cubed. That's a thousandth. You see how this works? Every time you raise 10 to a negative power, you move the decimal place over once to the left. So let's say you had a really annoying number, one that you didn't want to mess with, and it looked like this, 0 0.000234. That's an annoying number. What's your lead digit? Olivia? Two. Oh, so it's Tim, whatever? Two. Two. Two, Tim recognizes two as the lead digit. Whoa, is there a delay? I'm sorry, my phone is frozen. Uh, hold on, let me go to settings and let me go to display. I think that'll help a bit. All right. Um, Tim recognizes that two is the lead digit because it's the first non-zero number. So I would write two and I'd follow it with 34 cents times 10. What should my power be, class? Negative four. That's right, because you have to move the decimal place back one, two, three, four places to end up between the two and the three, all right? Now, when you type this into your calculator, you do not want to use the minus key or you're gonna get it wicked wrong. You wanna use the negative key, which is located above the seven. In other types of calculators, you might find a negative key down here. Does everyone know where their negative key is, including people like Matthew and Adrian using the TIA cra crazy fives and stuff? All right, all right. So let's just do this next one together. 5.6 times 6.725. When it comes time for the times 10, we're gonna hit EXP negative key six equals. What should I write down? First of all, you better see something like that. What should I write down? 3.8 times 10 to the negative five power. I love it. Notice that, um, that Adrian rounded, I think that was Adrian's voice. Adrian, was, that, was I right? Okay. Adrian rounded off to 3.8 which is always a good instinct, uh, Adrian, and raise it to the minus five power. Now, believe it or not, class, there are actual rules for rounding, and I might try to cover them at the end if there's enough time, all right? I will, I'll, we'll deal with rounding later, but for now, Adrian, your instincts are good. Let's hit this one next, okay? So it's 3.77 EXP5. We're just gaining some skills with our EXP key, okay? Make sure you punch along with me. Don't be a slacker times 4.8 exp3. Ah, oh, nuts, look at that thing right there. Okay, let's talk to someone uh, that I haven't talked to yet. Hey, Destiny, why don't you chat me up for a second? Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you help me put that into scientific notation? I know you might've come in a few seconds late, but hopefully you've got the scientific notation bit. Yeah, hold on, just give me a sec. Yeah, we can take it slow. Do, first of all, do you have the do you have a calculator? I can't remember if I I pestered you about this. Yeah, I have a calculator. 
Okay, is it my calculator or is it a different one? No, it's a different one. Wonderful, okay. Do you have this? Yes. Okay, what's your lead digit? One? Yeah, so let's write that down. Okay, what do you wanna keep for numbers after that? Eight. All right, fine. I'm okay with that, 1.8, I don't mind. Times 10, we'll just round off the rest of it. Um, what's your power? How many times do you have to move the decimal place? Eleven. Careful. No. Wait, can I see your calculator? Will you, where are you? Can you hold your calculator up to your camera, please? Yeah, one sec. Um, you got to kind of put it where your finger is there. Oh. Hmm. Okay. So what I think happened is you must have typed times 10. Can you hold your calculator up a little bit closer so I can see what bloody key you, is, you have there? You should have like an EXP key in there somewhere, but. Yeah, here. right here. Oh, did you use that thing? Yeah. Uh, let me, oh, I can see what you typed there. Let me count it on your screen. Hold it really still, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, you do have 11. How did that happen? Can you hold your, can you bring your calculator a little closer to the thing there? I, uh, what the crap? That looks right, but I, what's going on? What the hey did you do? All right, that calculator is wiggity wiggity whack. Okay, that's not, I don't, um, is that an iPhone that you've got there? No, it's just my computer. Oh, the calculator is your computer? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Punch it again. Look, this is what I get. If you look here, uh, Dest, see, this is one of the reasons why we all want to use the same bloody calculator. Um, mm -hmm. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now, one of the ways I've seen people get that number before Destiny is some people make the mistake of typing exp10, but it didn't look like you did that. It looked like you did it right. Like you should have punched 3.77 exp5 times 4.8 exp3. Is that what you typed? Yeah. Did, did it come out the same? I, I don't know. What's now, going on. now it comes out looking like yours. There's no extra zeros at the end. Awesome. Okay, so you must have hit a funky button that didn't show up in the display. And whatever mm -hmm. funky button you hit, don't hit that no more, okay? Okay, okay so the second time you're right. All right. Now, what would my power be? Nine. Very good. Um, part of the experience of lab students is it's supposed to be a little more hands-on and I'm supposed to kind of interact with you a bit. That can be obviously difficult because we're all in little boxes here, but we're going to try to recreate that experience as best we can. It doesn't do any good if, obviously I understand that you guys can be polite and you don't want to disrupt the class to say, hey, I got the wrong answer. That instinct makes sense to me, but it's the wrong instinct. We've got to talk to each other and if things aren't working out, we've got to fix them. So let's put a box around that. That's a good style. All right. I actually have a question. Yeah. So the parentheses um, don't really mean anything for... In, in general, parentheses are wicked important and they yeah. do matter. But the, the authors of this lab book, this lab book is now a few decades old. And while it's kind of clever and cool in some ways, one of their irritations is they put parentheses in the wackiest places. I think the concept here is they were trying to put parentheses around numbers that were in scientific notation. I think oh. they were probably thinking that some students might be confused 3.7 times 10 to the five times 4.8 times. They wanted you to see that these were being grouped together. But in this case, here's what's so cool, Megan. The EXP key prevents us from needing parentheses because it glues the number and the power together as a single number. And this actually matters a lot. So you've asked a very good question. You see, in order of operations, 
let's say I was going to do 2 exp5, and then I was going to square it. When I hit square, the calculator knows that the 2 and the 5 are all together, so it should square the whole bloody thing, 4 times 10 to the 10. Whereas it would not come out right if I tried to do 2 times 10 to the power of 5, and then I would square it, your order of operations would get all effed up. So okay. the exp key means we don't need to worry about the parentheses as much. Thank you. So um, let's do this next one, 5.29 exp3 times 6.8 exp negative key 7. Jennabelle, why don't you tell me what you got and what I should write down? Uh, I'll hold it up a little. All right, that looks good. Uh, wait, a little closer, a little closer. Yeah, okay. So tell me what to write. What would I write? Oh, I think you might be muted, Jennifer. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, you're going to write three. Yep. Point six. Okay. Times ten to the negative third power. Beautiful. All right. Down here we're gonna do a few more, but this time we're just gonna divide. You guys are making nice good progress. We're gonna to keep today's lab nice and easy going, all right? Let's just be uh, good boys and girls and let's punch this in. So 9.65 exp3. This time we're gonna hit divided by. 2.0. Okay, uh, Olivia, you're up. Can you help me put this into scientific notation? Uh, I can try, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, the first digit would be four. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, so it's uh, 4.2. Well, so the next number is, it's, it is, so um, eight is the next number, but that one doesn't di um, distinguish whether it changes, right? Is it the two that's after it that matters? It distinguishes it. Yeah. So, well, yeah. first of all, am I assuming that, that you mean you want to cut it off and you want to round it right here? Yeah. Then the two determines whether the eight stays eight or whether it becomes a nine. Right. Two is less than five, so. Right. So it would be... Uh, is 82 cents closer to 80 cents or 90 cents? 80 cents. So then it would be 4.8. Okay. Right? I'm assuming right, that you yeah. wanted to chop those, right? Okay. Yeah. And Times then, to what power? Um, to the third? Yes, because you have to move it three times. Yep. Which is 4,800. You're basically rounding 4,800. 125 to 4,800, okay? Right, okay. Okay, uh, Vanek, you're, you're gonna be next. Okay, so we have um, 5.6 to the EXP fifth, yep. yep, ESP. Divide by uh, 1.6. Now that's what I see, is that what you see? Six. Yep, I have 3.5. Okay. Now, normally we would just write 3.5 down. But in today's mm -hmm. exercise, we want to make sure that every number could be put into scientific notation. So would you know how to do that? Um, I just put 3.5 because okay. 3 is our lead number. Good. That's I like how you think. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the point. Five yep. times ten to the, I would say the first power because I'm moving it careful, one decimal careful. point. Three point um, five times ten to the one, ten. Sorry, I'm out of focus here. Yeah. Ten to the one is ten. That would be thirty-five, but we don't have mm -hmm. thirty-five. We have three point five. A better mm -hmm. question to ask is, your decimal place is there. And here, it's there. How many times did you have to move it? Oh, zero times. That's your power. Yeah. 
that's another way of saying 3.5 times one, which is weird, but yep. that's how you do it. Um, Tim, I'm gonna skip you because uh, you've obviously got some chops. So I know this is kind of like pulling teeth for you, but just bear with us, okay? Um, uh, Nick, talking to you is going to be irritating through the text, but I'm glad you're here. Ayanna, your microphone's kind of messed up too. Andrew, Andrew, my friend, why don't you help me with this? All right. Try. All right. So let's punch together. Let's do 3.2 exp9. I'm recording, right? I sure hope I am. All right, 3.2 exp9 divided by 2.4 exp5. You see that, Andrew? Yeah. Is that what you got? Yeah. How would I say that number in plain English? Uh, would it be 13,333.33? Yeah, exactly. Now, how should I, what should I write down here? Do you write 1.3? What else? X or times 10. Yep. And it would be to the fourth. Excellent. So we do one, two, three, four. Nicely done. Now listen, guys. Um, I've got about almost 15 minutes left to work with you. And up to now, you've been doing fine. I haven't really come down too hard on you on the rounding stuff. I've more been interested to see if you could handle punching your numbers in with the EXP key. And after a couple of hiccups, it looks like we've all gotten through that. Now it's time for us to have an adult conversation about measurement and rounding, okay? Let's talk about the metric system for a second. Let's talk about how we do measurements. We're gonna get back to that last one in just a moment, but I need to kind of yap at you for a few seconds here. So, Look at a fresh piece of paper and I'll lay it out. Actually, let me see if I can I go sideways on this beast. Yeah, there we go. This kind of topples over sometimes, but it sort of works. Okay. Ah, you bastard. Okay. Here's, um, here's a little ruler stick. It's got some metric units on it. I want you guys to get familiar with the metric system because we'll be using this to measure things in our class. All right. This is one centimeter. Do you guys see these little ticks here? Those are millimeters, okay? How many centimeters long is this ruler? Thirty. False. More than thirty. Right? Was that Vanek? Mm -hmm. That was me. Okay. Uh, thirty Van Van. I, I don't. Is it Vanek or Vanek? Which? How do you say uh, it? Vanek. 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 Okay. Yep. okay. There's thirty Vanek, but there's a little extra, ain't there? Oh yeah. Right. Like 30, I know. Thirty. Thirty. Point five. Excellent. But that, that, you missed that one the first time around, right? It's mm -hmm. tricksy. Sometimes even simple things can be tricksy. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is putting you too much on the spot, but would you know how many millimeters that is? The whole ruler? From there to the edge, from here to here? Okay. Let's take this slow. Oh, no. How many millimeters do I have there? Ten. Good. Here? So that's ten. So that's twenty. Right. Here? A hundred. Here? Oops. Here? So 
So that'd be a hundred thirty. No. Oh. No, no, no. Because you had a hundred here, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So. so that's two hundred. That'll be three hundred. And. Five millimeters. Very good, because there's five little ticks after the three hundred. Yep. Good. Yep. So. So, so we just discovered this millimeter is 30.5 or 305 millimeters. Mm -hmm. And another thing you just got a demonstration of, uh, Vinak, is I can say one centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. That's obviously true. Another way to write this down, which is different, is to say one millimeter is equal to a tenth of a centimeter. Both of those are the same conversion factor. They're just written in different ways. Mm -hmm. Now, when one does a measurement in professional sciences, one not only conducts the measurement, but one also takes some care and some thought into the quality of the measurement, into what care the measurer used their tool. Measurement depends upon two things. One is obviously the quality of your tool, like your meter stick. The other is you, the quality of the observer, because measurement, my little friends, is an art form, okay? Now, let's say I were to give you a task, one that I usually like to give students as an icebreaker, which is to measure the height of a person uh, in the room, right? And to do this, a meter stick isn't quite tall enough because it comes up to my hip or so. So I might make use of a two meter stick. I forgot to steal a two meter stick from the lab, so I'm gonna kind of build my own two meter stick, okay? Let me just stand back a little so you guys can see me. I'm gonna to attempt to measure my height, but when I ask students to take a measurement, I often specify the tolerance or the precision to which the measurement needs to be taken. Now, since my meter stick is gridded out to the nearest millimeter, it seems only fair that I should measure my own height to the nearest millimeter. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll take the meter stick. I'll put the ruler at the top of my head. I'll clamp it down. And I get 178.7. That's what I got. Now bear with me here because I'm trying to tell you a story and the story means something. So I just took a measurement of myself and I found that I was to the nearest millimeter, 187.7 centimeter, sorry, 187.7 centimeters tall. Now I want you guys to just meditate on this measurement with me here. Let's say I, I wanted to record this for posterity. So I chiseled it into a stone tablet and I buried it in the Sahara Desert for future archeologists to find, okay? And later on, they unearthed my stone tablet and it says, this here dude was 187.7 centimeters tall, okay? They would automatically know something when they read this number, they would know something about the quality to which my measurement was taken. They could say, this here dude, he took the time to measure himself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter. This is what we call in science the precision of the measurement. A machinist would call it the tolerance. It's the care to with which the measurement was taken. And unfortunately in science you need to think about this because the quality of the measurement sometimes has an impact on the meaning of the measurement. Um, one way we would typically write this is use the plus or minus sign. You say the tolerance of this measurement was to the nearest tenth of a centimeter, which means to the nearest millimeter. Same thing, right? Now, in this number, this number contains what we would call four significant figures. And it's four significant figures because each of the numbers tells you meaningful information about my height. If I'm over 100 centimeters tall, that means I'm taller than a munchkin, all right? And if I'm over 180 centimeters tall, I'm getting close to two meters, 
I'm not quite 190 centimeters tall, right? I'm, I'm, I'm three centimeters short of that. But if you wanted to get down into the weeds, as we sometimes do, if you wanted to count out the millimeter tick marks, I am seven millimeter tick marks. Let's look at this because it's good for you to look at it. Not only am I 177, but I'm actually seven more tick marks past that on this hair meter stick. I did not convey information above this. For instance, if I was a real nut, which sometimes I am, I could have attempted to measure this to the nearest hundredth of a centimeter. That would have meant taking one of these spaces and trying to subdivide it into 10 more places in my mind. That probably would have been a bit ambitious. If I had tried to guess at that next level of precision, it would have been a little bit more guessy than it would have been measuring, you know? Okay. <clears throat> There's another way to look at tolerances as well. Um, a physicist would look at this number and they would say that this number has a precision of one part, sorry, let me write that again, of one part in a thousand. And the reason why they would say that this measurement is accurate or precise to one part in a thousand is that to measure to a dime out of a hundred bucks is the same number of subdivisions as measuring to the nearest dollar out of a thousand bucks, right? It's sometimes less interesting where the decimal point is and how many digits of goodness you have. Whether you realize it or not, every number that you write down has significant figures and has a certain tolerance to it. For instance, um, if you were to write the number of teeth in the human head, how many teeth are in the human head? I don't know, 30 something? Do you know, Adrian, 32? All right. So if I write down the number 32 teeth, I'm presuming that this measurement is, is al dente. It's to the nearest tooth, right? It's to the tooth. And uh, maybe if you have a cracked tooth, it could be 31 and a half or something. But otherwise than that, this is, this is a measurement that has two significant figures. However, sometimes you want to describe less precision, right? Sometimes you have some money in your, in your pocket like you have $499 in a quarter. But you might tell your friend, yo dog, I got 500 bucks, right? And that's not a lie. You're just giving your friend a lower precision estimate of your pocket. If you told him 499 and a quarter, you would sound like a robot, like Rain Man. You wouldn't need all that precision. Now, if you say 500 bucks, that means you're telling him how much money you have to the nearest one significant figure, to the nearest $100 bill. If you tell your friend that you have $550, now you're telling him two significant figures because you're telling him how much money he has to the nearest $10, or how much money you have to the nearest $10 bill. Um, what about $505? How many significant figures does that have? Three. Right, because you're telling your friend to the nearest dollar bill how much you have. What if you tell your friend that you have 50 cents? Actually, writing it like this is different than writing it like this. This number has one significant figure. This number has two significant figures. It's kind of funny how that works. Maybe you're not going to understand significant figures in a day, but I'm going to try to make you understand it. The trouble with significant figures comes when you start doing math on numbers. Because when you put things into your calculator, it can make them seem like they have different amounts of precision. Let's take this number here. Let's type it into my calculator again. I've got 3.2 EXP9 divided by 2.4 EXP5. And all of those digits come out. Just because your calculator spits out a bunch of digits does not mean those numbers have anything to do with your measurement. Most of these numbers are lies. They are lies told by the calculator. And you, as the scientifically literate person, needs to know which numbers are real and which ones are fake numbers. How many significant figures does my top number have? Can you tell me? It's 
Two. Two. When you put a number in a scientific notation, these are the significant figures here. The times 10 to the power of nine is different. The bottom also has two. So how many do I keep? Two, says Adrian. And he's correct. Andrew did a good job. When Andrew instinctively rounded to two sig figs, that matched the precision. Let's try this next number together. Let's type it in. This will be our last problem. 2.99792 exp8 divided by 5.520 exp minus 7 and hit equals. We need to figure out which of these numbers are good and which one of them don't matter. How many sig figs does the top number have? Six. Very good. What about the bottom? Four. Good. Here, the five, the five, the two, and the zero all count. Okay, Adrian, since you're so good, how many do I get to keep in my final answer? Four. Right. The crappiest number pollutes your answer. Whatever the crappiest number is, that's going to pollute your final answer. So what should I round this to in good faith then, Adrian? Uh, 5.431. Keep going. You forgot some bits. These are not significant, but- Times 10 to the 14th power. Yeah, you, you can't forget that. That's sacred, right? So this becomes 5.431. Nice. And that's probably what we're gonna call our lab for the day. I'll just, we'll do a shortened version, okay? Now, uh, we have to have a talk here about a bunch of different things before we stop. So let me get out of this share mode. Does everyone have all that? Does anyone need to see any of this again? Yo! Someone's excited. <laughs> Someone's excited. Um, let me just show you those one more time. Okay. All right. One last thing about the precision stuff. Um, there are things that I care about a lot and things that I'm more flexible about. If a number is greater than 1 million, I care a lot that you put it into scientific notation because I don't want to sit there counting your zeros. I got better things to do. And that's courtesy. It's a, it's a courtesy that you share to your fellow peoples. Um, rounding, I would like you to know about because there's a few moments in this class where it will really count. But for the most part, if you don't know what you're doing, round to two sig figs, and that's good instinct. 90% of the time, that'll be the right instinct. Um, oh, uh, Ayana asked a question I'd like to address. Does that happen every time when dividing when the exponent is the same? Well, here, Ayana, I would say that the exponent was not the same, correct? One exponent was eight, and the other exponent is minus seven. So I'm not sure if I understood you or not. Hold on, did you type something to me? Oh, to be. Um, oh, oh, I see, you were asking me a while ago. I didn't see it until now. Uh, yeah, when the exponent is the same, it, it, it depends, uh, Ayana, because if I did like 52 times 10 to the zero divided by one times 10 to the zero, I don't wanna go back to my stupid iPhone because it'll be annoying. Um, here's a case where it wouldn't work that way, right? Because here, I don't know if you can see this. 52 divided by one would give you 52. That would be 5.2 times 10 to the one. I, I, I would not say that's true. It's not true every time. I'll leave it at that, Ayana, but I can show you some more examples going forward, okay? Trust me, you're gonna be doing enough math with me that you will intuitively learn what is good and what is bad as we go forward. That's one of the nice things about doing it together is you've got a friend here who can keep you on the right train track and keep you from going astray, all right? Um, 
let's first talk about submitting this lab, which is important. Then let's talk about how we're going to meet next time for office hours. Capiche? Okay, now Yimmercy joined our class late. Yimmercy, you missed a bunch of stuff, kind of important stuff. Luckily for you, I'm going to be, I've been recording this entire lecture and lab, and I will be uploading it to YouTube so that you can watch it later and get the work done if you didn't follow us here. For those of you who are done, let's make sure that you have your iPhone in most compatible mode. How many of you are rocking the iPhone? I just need to see some hands here. I figured a few of you. We need to get your pictures to most compatible. So go to settings and now click uh, photos, no, not camera, settings and scroll down a while till you see camera and go into camera. Now I'm using an old crappy iPhone, the iPhone 5, so mine doesn't have this, but you guys probably have a modern ones. Do you see something that says formats there somewhere? Do you see a little tab? Go into formats. Hold that up, Olivia. Can you hold that up for me? Okay. Uh, you got to get it right in front of your camera there. Oh, look, at, look, at, look, at, look at Janabelle's right there. Once you go into formats, there's high quality versus most compatible. And Janabelle, you clicked on most compatible, right? Sorry, what's up? Mine's was on high efficiency, but I can click on most compatible. Most compatible is our man. That's okay. going to make sure you guys send me JPEGs that I can actually read. Okay. I'm telling you, this is important because if I can't read your papers, then I'm going to give you a zero. We don't want that. And we can test it right now and see how it goes. Now, are, is anyone rocking the Android? Because there might be a slightly different set of directions for Android. Um, Ayana, because I'm not familiar with the Androids, I... I don't know if your picture is gonna automatically come out as a JPEG or what, but do you have a settings? You must have settings in your phone, right? Do you have camera settings? Can you tell me what the, it says in the camera settings or hold it up so I can get a sense of what's going on? And if there's anyone here as an Android user and can help me, then please do. But I bet there's camera settings and you can ch hold that up to me. Uh, hold on, wait, I need to maximize you. Don't move, don't move. Uh, where are you? Okay. Okay, see how it says H-E-I-F? Oh, yeah, you looks like you turned that off, right? Do you see this says H-E-I-F pictures? You want to have that off, and that's currently off, correct? So we'll find, show me the whole thing again. Show me the whole bloody thing. I think that's going to that's gonna work out for us, okay? That should keep it in JPEGs. All right. By the way, you can also scan too, but let's just talk about how to do this. So um, why don't we try it with you, Ayana? Take, your, take a photograph of the page that we just worked on. Make sure it's in focus and all that so I can read it. And um, let me share my screen with you guys. We are going to go to turn this in. I just want to make sure that we avoid these bumps and bruises the first day on. You go to your lab session, right, in Blackboard. This is lab one. So you guys will click lab one, and then you will go to um, browse my computer or browse your phone, and that's where you're going to upload the picture. Let's see if any of you have done it, and I can check it out. Looks like I've got a needs grading already. Oh, shoot, no one's uploaded. Does someone want to try that, and we can see what it looks like? Sorry, Jennifer, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, I'm working on it right now. I just airdropped it to my laptop. Yeah, okay. Um, by the way, some of the students said you can go right on this from your phone. If you don't feel like doing the airdrop in the future, uh, I think you can log into the CCRI thing from your phone and log into Blackboard and upload it from there. I think that's what... Well, yeah, you're right. well, you know, Tim, Tim, you used to do this for our previous class, right? So how do you do it? No, remember I wasn't because I was making oh. it up from. Oh yes, yeah, so you've never done this before either, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, then you give it a shot too. Let's see if this works. I just want to. I don't have to check everyone, but I just want to see if a couple of people can upload this. Oh, I got one item to grade. Who did that? Ayana. Cool. Ayana, let's see what it looks like if I try to grade yours. Okay. 
So here we go. Oh, yeah, sick. So in the future, you'll try to reorient that for me, okay? Do, grading that sideways is not going to be fun, okay? Um, but do you see, everyone, how you can at least see a preview of Ionis in the box? That's what you want. You want to be able to see a preview, but please, could you rotate it? Yeah, try to take another picture and upload it again, okay? You guys have multiple attempts, so you can just keep uploading it until it looks good. Let's see if anyone else has uploaded it. Okay, here we go. We got Nicholas. Nick, let's see how yours looks. There's Ionis. Nicholas, this is awesome. Oh, guys, do you see up at the top where it says lab section? Always write AS1010. It should be obvious, but just in case, try to keep AS1010 up there. That way I don't confuse you with AS1020. But Nicholas, this looks awesome. Can everyone see how I can see a preview of Nicholas's paper and my grading thing? That's what I want to see when you upload it. I want to be able to quickly look and see your doodah there, okay? We got a third person up. Andrew, let's see how yours looks. Ayanna, yours is still sideways. All right, Andrew, this is less good. Now, I don't know why, Andrew, but instead of me just seeing the picture, I'm getting a hyperlink. I don't know if that's because your picture is too big and in, in the size of the photo. Now, yes, Andrew, if needs be, I can click on it and I can see it. But do you see how I had to kind of leave Blackboard to do it? That makes it more complicated for me. Yeah. So I, I can accept this, Andrew, but I like it less. You see? Right. Yeah, I'm just doing it through the phone. That might, that might be why. Yeah, and we'll try to... Pardon? I'm sorry. I'm having trouble finding the uploading section so I can upload a picture. I clicked on lab. Yep. And then I there I'm you, going to lab one. Click on that. Yep. Okay. And then, okay, there you go. Sorry. Now it works. That's okay. That's why I'm here to help you guys do this. This is actually nice to, to be able to do this uh, together. Um, so, Yimmercy, I hope you're going to catch up to this, and I, I know you were here for most of the lab, so if, but you might have not known how to find the lab and some other things. You might want to watch the beginning of this lecture. Now listen, here's the deal. So it looks like you guys are on the way towards submitting it. I'm happy to look, oh, look at this. Oh, you guys are killing it. Let's see how we're doing here. I'll just let you know who's doing it good and who's doing it. Wait a minute. Sorry. That's not right. I've got five attempts. Let's try Jasmine's. Let's, well, hold on. So Nicholas, I have no idea why they put some people. Nicholas looks good. Nick, Andrew, you got this stupid thing going on. This is annoying, but maybe you can try to fix that. Matthew, this is bad, okay? I don't know why it's appearing as a download, but that's not good for me for a whole bunch of reasons. I don't want to download your thing. I don't want to go, I don't have to click any wacky shit like that. I don't, you know what I mean? That's just unhealthy computer practice. So Matthew, I don't know why. I don't know why if you guys are all doing this, why sometimes, now did you scan yours, Matthew? No, I just downloaded it, it saved that as a PDF. Well, it was why isn't it uploading as a, P why is it doing this? Like I don't no, want to. I can try saving it just as a Word document and upload it. I will, I will totally lose your stuff if I have to do it this way. Um, yeah, maybe try uploading it. As, so that's okay. I can see it. By the way, you got to have your name. Oh, you do. Okay, never mind. Your name in AS1010. But I don't like that, how it's a download. That's really bad for me, okay? Not, it's just very hard to grade your papers that way. And... Obviously, you guys don't want to make my life any harder than it has to be since I determined your grade. You want to put me in a good mood when I'm grading papers, all right? Um, let's see how everyone else's is looking so we can overcome these issues here. So you're going to work on that, Matthew. See if you can fix that in the future. Yeah, also, Matthew, when I have to download and go back, I lose my place in the queue. It's just horrible. It's hard to explain why, but it's horrible. Ayanna, we're going to see if yours is straight this time. Blackboard is annoying, so it takes a while to load. 
I don't know what's going on. Let me skip ahead. Jasmine. I'm sorry, Adrian, right, right. Um, this looks awesome. This looks good, okay? Adrian, this is good. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, that's, let me go back. So can all of you guys make it good? Do you now understand what's the difference between, go oh, hey, Ayana, mwah, beautiful, okay? Do you guys now understand the difference between good and not good? This is good. And- you Say that. Are you able to see mine's clear? I just want to make sure that I upload it properly. Uh, who? Oh, uh, Annabelle. Yeah, hold on. Um, let's let's try that. Let me see where you are in the queue here. Sorry, needs grading. Uh, yeah, I want to see. Oh, uh, we'll check out Megan's too. So you're down here. Oh wait, hey Megan, where's Megan? Megan, you uploaded this to homework one. You got to upload it to lab one, right? Oh yeah, my bad. But That's did it bad. come through though? Well, let's find out, but you need to get this out of there because you need to, oh, that's going to be very confusing for me. Please make sure you, sorry. Okay. That does look good. It's, okay. that looks great. Okay. In the future uh, on your paper, have your name and AS 1010 on it. Of course. Yeah, that's just a. All right, but that looks good. Please do not upload it to homework one, upload it to lab one. Sorry. Okay. That's all right. You'll be able to upload homework one next time. So I'll just leave that there. Uh, Genevieve, let's check yours. Hold on a sec. I got to go cycle through the damn thing. It always starts me at the top of the list. Genevieve, that's great. It's great. Okay, thank you. Um, so Matthew, you're going to try to figure out what went wrong and try to do that better, right? Yeah, I just re-uploaded it as a Word doc and it looks a little better. Like you can actually see it in the preview. Oh, cool. That's great for me. Okay. So, uh, oh, it says attempt in progress. Let me see here. Let's see if it says two of two. Where? Oh yeah, attempt two of two. So let me, uh, users. let's see if I go back, if it'll give me Matthew without having to go forward. No, stupid thing. Three, four, five, six. Oh, Destiny, you got some issues. Oh, we talked about them. Hey, that's, that's good, bud. That's great, okay? So do that from now on, okay? Okay. Um, you'd think PDF would be more reliable. So Destiny, I don't know why yours is doing this thing. I can read it, it's fine, but I wish it would show up as a, I wish I could see it in the box. Do you understand Destiny? Are you still there with me? You're hiding on me. Sorry, yeah, I'm here. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do it. Yeah, I don't know. But this is, at least I can see this. Okay, look, obviously I don't want to take up your whole damn day. Um, Figure it out, submit it to me. Destiny, if that's the best you can do, it'll work. But I'd, I'd like it if I, did you see how everyone else's I could see a preview? Yeah, I, I don't know why it submits it like twice. I don't know why there's two separate. I don't know if you see that, but. I should ask one of the IT people because this is happening and I, I suspect Destiny that if it's too big a file size, maybe they do that. I don't know. Okay. Um. Well, let's just say one more thing and then I'm gonna let you all go. Uh, the next thing that we have ahead of us is Wednesday's class, right? Now today we started at noon because you didn't know what the heck was going on. But now you know that we have a homework assignment to do every week, right? I'm not every week, every day, every damn class period that we meet because it's like a once a week thing for class. So. Don't worry, if you want to look over the homework problems and try them, by all means, you're welcome to. But I'm guessing you're going to have enough stuff going on in your personal lives that you can just show up Wednesday at 10 a.m. and we'll do all the homework together before class. All five problems, okay? But I need you guys all to be there. Every time people try to do the homework on their own, it ends up to be a bloody mess. You learn less, you're more stressed out, and most of the time you don't even end up finishing it. And that's the worst. 
If we all just put in the extra time together, we can make this fun. Take it from Tim. He took my 1020 course. What do you say about the office hours, Tim? They were awesome. It really helps. Like if yeah. you go to it, you have no problems. Some of it might be confusing, but it's, it's necessary. It's a huge help. Yeah. And, and remember, there's no class that you could go to where you wouldn't have a whole bunch of outside work to do, right? Like if you took an English class, you're gonna have to write some long, annoying papers. If you take a psychology class, you might have to do a report or something. I'm making it so that it's all in the can. Once we get the astronomy done for the day, you're just done and you don't have to worry about anything else. If I was a student, I would think that that was a way better deal. I put in the extra two hours with the professor and then I just wash my hands of it and I don't have to worry about it anymore. It'll also make sure that we don't ever screw up or slack off. We just kind of stay in the same routine together, okay? So I hope I've, I hope I've expressed to you how important and good it is. It's not the worst time in the world. You just kind of sit there, you can be half asleep and zone out and just follow the bouncing balls. Sometime I'll ask you annoying questions, but you can deal with that, okay? So I'll see you guys Wednesday, a little after 10 a.m. I'll send out the link. Sound like a plan? All right. Um, these are gonna be long days, but we'll get through them and we'll try to have fun. So I'm gonna end the recording. Stop.